Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's event. I am Robert Doerr, the Mortgage Scholar in Poverty Studies here at AEI, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this long-anticipated uh, session, two sessions, on predictive analytics. It's an important topic, and we're very glad to host some very distinguished panelists to discuss it today for all of you and for those tuning in on live stream. Um, in the two and a half years since, with the inspiration of Arthur Brooks, that we began the Poverty Studies Program at AEI, we have blogged, we have written op-eds, we've produced research reports, we've done congressional testimony, and we've built a team. And we are in sort of the makings of a community of people dedicated to talking about these issues in a serious way in efforts to help low-income Americans. And no member of that team has made a stronger contribution than Maura Corrigan, who my role is to introduce. Maura is uh, one of those rare people who is both has experience as a chief judge of a state uh, Supreme Court and also as a commissioner of social services. And, um, and I have to say, she had the courage to leave the uh, 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 August um, uh, uh, world of the, of the court and the judiciary to really, as someone who's been in social services, a former commissioner, to get into the even harder world of, of commissioner of social services. So I admire Maura terrifically. And I'm very, very glad to welcome her and to introduce her today to start our session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that very kind introduction. And good morning to all of you in our audience and who are live streaming with us this morning. I join Robert in welcoming you to AEI for this morning's program. The topic is Preventing Harm to Children Through Predictive Analytics. It is one of great interest. Our audience today consists of policymakers and practitioners, uh, child welfare and human services uh, representatives are with us from 12 different states in the union. In addition, we have representatives from the US Department of Health and Human Services, the National Governors Association, Casey Family Programs, Child Welfare League of America, Pew Charitable Trusts, Child Trends, uh, the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, APHSA, the Secretary's Innovation Group, and we have various universities uh, researchers. This is a topic of great interest. Um, and as the morning unfolds, we'll be welcoming the questions and the comments from our audience. We have two panels this morning, one of industry experts who started this story in child welfare, and our second panel is a panel of child welfare leaders. Uh, this is a new area for child welfare in the United States. Predictive analytics has only been utilized for about the past five years, and we're pleased to have the people who began the story with us this morning in Tampa, Florida. Um, <clears throat> is predictive analytics a cure for cancer in child welfare? Uh, is it a silver bullet, as some has said? I don't know the answer, but I do know that is full of promise if we get it right. And it, as my colleague Joette Katz, she and I are in the club of former Supreme Court justices who run human services or child welfare. As she indicated rightly, there are questions that plague child welfare around disproportionality, uh, around overrepresentation that affect this area as well. And our mission in exploring this new area is to be open and transparent and tackle these problems as they arise in the unfolding of this new uh, technique. Certainly many disciplines in the United States are using predictive analytics today. It is a $27 billion industry. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal reported on the mining of medical malpractice data to improve healthcare safety. Perhaps the very first use of predictive analytics in this country occurred in Robert Doerr's home territory, New York City, when the New York Police Department decided in the early 90s to look at crime data and target its limited resources to work on crime prevention. In, in that effort, of course, the uh, 
something called Comstat was born and Comstat multiplied across the United States of America. We have seen a 40% reduction in violent crime in the United States, much attribut attributable, I believe, to the use of Comstat. If we were able to mine data in child welfare uh, and intervene with good casework by the mining of that data, perhaps we would reduce the 1,500 to 3,000 deaths from child abuse and neglect in this country each year. And certainly in the protection of rights, the most important right is the right to life itself. If this is possible in child welfare, it's our obligation to pursue it. And I am thrilled that among our panelists today is Dr. David Sanders, who chaired the uh, Commission to Eliminate Child and Abuse Neglect Fatalities in the United States. And I look forward to Dr. Sanders and our second panel of child welfare leaders who will discuss this. We are very proud to present the story of predictive analytics here at AEI. We uh, thank you and we will tackle your questions and impart what wisdom we can in this emerging science. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the program this morning to our moderator of our first panel, Judge Jim Payne. He is currently a consultant at PCG. He's been a judge also for 20 years who stepped down to run the very first child welfare division in the state of Indiana. He is my colleague and friend, but I think of him as sort of the St. Paul of predictive analytics <laughs> because he has been talking about this subject b before I ever knew what predictive analytics was. Jim Payne was talking about it. So Judge Jim Payne, welcome and the, the floor is yours. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, Justice. Uh, Mom would have enjoyed hearing that. Um, we have agreed as a panel that we will do no introductions other than name. Uh, we have a panel today that is incredibly knowledgeable and gifted in the, in the issue of predictive analytics. And so um, I will introduce their names only. If you need more, there may be a brochure or a, a uh, online, but they're incredibly gifted and tr incredibly important in child welfare and in predictive analytics. I would only suggest that, as the justice said, I've been talking about predictive analytics now for more than six years and wonder why, why aren't we moving faster? And then about six months ago, I, I was in Chicago and I saw this, and I'll just read the headline. Local firm provides platform as aid in predicting mass killings around the world. And the question in my mind is, if they can do that kind of thing with the data that might be available internationally, why aren't we doing a better job in, in the United States at the local level with predictive analytics? And what you're going to hear today is that we can. And it is being done in all of the right places and moving in the right direction. As we heard, though, it is, not, it is not the solution. It is a guide that will help particularly our young workers, but I think every worker on the issue of how we address the issue of child abuse and neglect. So our first speaker today will be Andy Barkley from Georgia. Our second will be Greg Pavolny from Mindshare in Florida. And then finally, Brian Leonard from Eckerd Foundation, where uh, those two work closely together on the issue in Hillsboro, uh, Florida, in, in you really implementing a, a quality predictive analytics program. So uh, we've agreed to 15 minutes because what we're interested, in, what they are interested in more than anything else, I think, is your questions. So they can really respond to what you may question about predictive analytics. So Andy, you're up. Okay. So I'm going to lay the groundwork a little bit with definitions and terminology. And what, I'm, what I, I hope for is that I give you some tips to be smart shoppers in this uh, predictive analytics marketplace. Uh, what I'm looking for is, um, is 
uh, heads of foundations and uh, child welfare administrators who are going to buy products or perhaps uh, work on development of some of these products. And I think there are a few things about predictive analytics that you need to know. You need to be able to identify it to see what is and what is not predictive analytics. Um, so the analytics part is a fairly broad term. Um, and it, it can refer to a lot of things, but I narrow it down to the core of predictive analytics is, is modeling and predictive modeling. So we look back at our historical data generally, and we, then in each of those cases that we have, we know outcomes over 20 years in many cases. We can train, and that's, what, that's the word they use, so that's one of the words you need to look for. We can train models to predict events if we, we don't tell them what the outcome is and we ask the model, the machine, if it can predict this thing and we can know whether it got it right or not. So that's where we get into things like false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. And those are some of the words that I know they're, they're terrible oxymorons, but I, I want you to be familiar with them so that when you're shopping or you're looking at these products that, uh, that vendors are pushing, um, you can see, you want to ask about false positives, particularly when we, we're talking about events here. And, and we agreed that we're talking about predicting uh, harm to children. And so this would be an event. Um, that those events uh, are um, rare. And so when, when you have a very rare event, you, you have to be very careful that your false positives don't overwhelm you. Uh, so I have a slide. I guess I can advance. Let's see. Yes, OK. Um, in, uh, so we've done some pilots in Georgia. Uh, you probably can't see this, so I'll describe it. Um, we have about 1,200 children every year uh, who, within 90 days after an intake call, uh, this is an intake of maltreatment. So we get a call. We, we spend about 20 minutes on the phone taking down information. Within 90 days of that call, about 1,200 of those children will be re-maltreated. Those are failures. So those are cases that we missed. But those 1,200, or, or I'm sorry, I think it's about 2,300, um, those 2,300 come out of a pool of 120,000 calls that we get. And so that horizontal axis would actually stretch around the block if it were to scale. So those, if we flag each of those as a, as, and we do a in full investigation on each of those, it would completely overwhelm our system. Those are false positives to a model. The model is trying to predict those 2,300 out of this giant haystack of, of 120,000. Um, and in doing that, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be trained on a lot of data. This one was trained on data that states report up to the federal government uh, every year. It's a basic data set common to all the states, and most of the states have been reporting it for about 20 years. It's stuff we can do today. And the model can actually predict um, in a full range, and th this is showing the range. This is how we describe this tool. Um, it's, again, terrible terminology, but I want you to be familiar with it. Uh, receiver operating characteristics curve. Yeah. Um, so this comes from radar in uh, uh, World War II. And uh, the radar signals would go out, and they'd bounce off a, a, a Nazi um, bomber. And we'd get a receiver that would receive that signal back. And we were trying to distinguish that bomber from a flock of geese. That's an ROC curve. It, it's, uh, it's a fundamental tool in predictive analytics. And one of the measures that they rate models by and they compare them on is the area under that curve. It's how much of the full box that that curve covers. Perfect prediction would be with that gold star up in the left-hand corner. Uh, and we don't get there. But worst case is random guessing, and that's that diagonal line. Most of the tools that we're using now in child welfare for risk assessment, they're on that diagonal line. We can do a lot, a lot better. So we're turning up a lot of false positives, but we don't, we don't even measure that. So we wouldn't know it. 
so the tools, these tools are a significant jump um, in, in our ability to predict. Um, continuing on my, my theme of uh, confusing terminology, there's a thing called a false positive, which I've referred to a few times. So the, the positive part of that is the test. The test is going to signal whether this is a child who's going to be maltreated in the next 90 days or not, a positive or a negative. Now whether the model gets that right or not, that's the true or false part. So we're looking for a lot of trues, true positives and true negatives. But really what we're interested in are those true positives. We want to get as many of them as we can. And we want to do that at the cost of false positives. And we want to minimize that cost. Now, this model can get you from where we are now, which is approximately a 50 to 1 shot in, in being right, to a 2 to 1. So about half of the, the flagged cases that this model might throw out will not actually be maltreated in the next 90 days. They may be maltreated after that, and they're probably high-risk cases anyway. But I can say with some, some certainty, given 20 years of data, that this model will tell you half the time that you're going to have a, an event that you're going to miss. These are cases that we missed. So this is a real-world application. Um, it's, it's a, it, it, these are, are terrifically difficult problems, uh, particularly when you get into the realm of uh, predicting child fatalities much more rare than a child maltreatment case. Um, that's going to take a lot of data. It's going to take a lot of silos of data put together. And we, we now have these tools can actually be used for that as well. A lot of these silos identify um, children and families in different ways. And we don't know that we, we're talking about the same family in two different silos, our birth records, our death records, our driver's license database, they all use different identifiers. Um, these tools can help us put that together in a very smart way. So that's, I, th I think that gives you a general idea of the terminology. I, I want to get across things like metrics for measuring this, particularly ROC curves and area under the curve. So look for those things when you're out looking at predictive analytics and make sure they're predicting. They actually a lot of the models that I see out there that are called predictive analytics are good old-fashioned explanatory statistical models. They are not predictive. They're not good at this. And they're billing them as predictive. And they're not. So I'll hand it off to Greg with that. Thank you, Andy. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how we uh, implement all of what Andy just said. We'll talk. There's a lot of topics, really, that we could talk about with predictive analytics. Um, what I want to focus on today is, is operationalizing it, where it's actually used in daily use. Uh, and the second piece is feature engineering uh, I want to talk about. And then I have a 12-month uh, set of findings. We ran a predictive model over 12 months, and we're going to look at some actual output. Um, just want to point out that you know we've been doing data analytics on child welfare data since 2005. We've been working with predictive analytics for the last five years and operationalizing it, deploying it in various jurisdictions over the past two years. Um, so we've been really doing a deep dive on child welfare data, SACWIS data, Medicaid, education, DJJ, uh, a litany of different data sources bringing that together and uh, performing this predictive analytics of which we'll look at one example uh, today. So with regard to the predictive models, um, again, uh, the objective here is to pull the facts out of the data. And we'll talk about some of the building blocks of creating a predictive model. Um, but uh, I want to talk about that. I want to also talk about how to operationalize it because I think daily use and uh, daily predictive uh, analytics is key to the success here. Um, what you're going to see is our predictive models are at a child level. 
So we're really trying to address issues right at the front line. And then if you look at the, the bottom of this slide, it talks about the predictive models that are actually deployed and in use right now, the first of which is mitigating the uh, likelihood of a, a life-threatening or child fatality uh, type of an episode. Brian will talk about that with regard to how they've employed this predictive model in their Eckerd rapid safety feedback process. Uh, also, the uh, mitigation uh, of uh, recurrence or the likelihood of recurrence of maltreatment. Um, there's another one, which is uh, the example we'll look at today, which is the mitigating the likelihood of failed reunifications or reentry back into the system. Uh, also, uh, mitigating the likelihood of a prolonged stay in care or delayed permanency. And then there's some uh, other ones centered on early education patterns. So the building blocks that Mindshare uses for the predictive modeling is, first of all, a well-defined problem statement. Our predictive models are not generic. They're very specific, and they align with a single outcome, okay? Maltreatment, uh, recurrence, um, education. So they're very, very specific, okay? If, if there, there certainly can be multiple predictive models being used at the same time, but the predictive models that we implement are solving one single uh, uh, very detailed problem statement. We also need historical data. Andy mentioned that we're, we're looking to uh, train the model and have the uh, model learn from the histor historical details. So we need historical data to create and build a model. And then as I talk about operationalizing, we need access to daily feeds to get this thing online. And then there's the funnel. I want to talk about the funnel. Uh, because this is very important to us. When, what is the cohort of children or victims that are actually in the predictive model and, and that we're performing predictive analytics on? So in this example, the examples you hear about today, both from Brian as well as the one I'm going to show here in just a few minutes, is children known to the department. If they're not known to the department, if they're not in the data, they're not subject to be analyzed by these predictive analytics. And you can see the funnel can be uh, as wide as we want to define it, uh, as deep as we want to uh, define it, but uh, the essence is from the minute the child arrives in the data or known to the department, uh, perhaps that's a, a call at the hotline. We can begin the analytics and produce a probability of a particular outcome that's defined in that problem statement. And then as they move through that funnel, there are certain things that can happen. Those probabilities are subject to change daily, for that matter. Number two, um, perhaps if there's going to be some kind of quality assurance process applied to these uh, outputs that we present with the predictive analytics, it could be done throughout this entire process. Feature engineering. Uh, just want to talk about this because uh, oftentimes folks might think that we're just taking the raw data, throwing it into a predictive model, and then outspits hopefully the right answers. That is not the case. There's a tremendous amount of data science involved here. Uh, that means data scientists are looking at the data, creating uh, and tuning and training the model with different parameters, applying different algorithms, looking at the output of those algorithms, changing the parameters of the algorithms. And so feature engineering is this idea of taking the raw data and creating features out of it, enhanced uh, attributes. So if you look at the top there, these standard scalar variables might be age, might be perpetrator, might be allegation. Those aren't necessarily features. They're uh, important to the predictive model, but we are actually applying domain expertise to the data. We're deriving new multi-dimensional uh, attributes from that set of scalar data. For example, conditions at a particular time, frequency, uh, uh, frequency and sequence, frequency of sequence, um, information derived from ad hoc narratives. So I want to just go through a couple of these because when I start to show the output, I just really want to kind of leave you with the flavor that a lot has went behind this, not just, you know, here's a dashboard with probabilities. So here's an example of a single attribute, uh, perpetrator, okay? In, in fact, not just perpetrator, but the mother being a perpetrator. And you can see here that there's much more involved in a, 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 an engineered feature around perpetrator. Those codes underneath um, 
the mother there would be actual attributes that we've derived from the data. Those are whether or not the mother was the perpetrator, whether the allegations were substantiated, whether it was a repeat uh, situation, whether or not the mother was a victim in the system earlier in her uh, life, and uh, that sort of thing. And you can see that those codes are in different order. So that means you know it was substantiated first, then followed up with a repeat, or it was a repeat followed up by a substantiated. So I don't want to get too detailed in this, just that it's a very complex process. And what we're dealing with here is the, the patterns, for, in this case, from investigations closed with no action, followed by uh, a subsequent substantiated life-threatening episode, and here are the patterns of the, per the mother as a perpetrator in that example. So this goes into the model, and then we can apply the algorithms on these type of attributes. Real quick, just a couple more examples, I won't belabor. We can derive variables out of ad hoc case notes, okay? Violence in a case, we can pull that out of some ad hoc narratives. Poor quality supervisory oversight. We can derive that based on things like copy notes, latent notes, uh, perhaps even in this example that we're showing um, a situation where there was uh, very much violence in a case, there were threats to kill, followed by the supervisory review of a single sentence, the follow-on month, a copied note. Live in Paramore, derived again from the data. Okay. So those are some examples of, of uh, features that are derived from the raw data. Another output of the predictive modeling is the attribute ranking. When it's all done, when we're trained, when we're happy with the model, we can look at these attributes in rank order. These are the attributes that are most common, and in this example, we're looking at uh, failed reunifications. These would be reentries into care. These are the attributes that are most common to those reunifications that failed. Okay, and you can see uh, some of them have to do with caseworker interactions with the parents, caseworker interactions with the child, um, placement instability while the child was in care, uh, things of that nature. So we could go through these in more detail later, but um, again, just another piece of output from the predictive model itself. Now, when we talk about daily use, this is an example of what perhaps Brian's team would look at every day. This is a dashboard that shows at a child level, these, and this example is again, reunifications. These are all children who are set to be reunified. And you can see in the third column, the probability. This is the probability that if this child is reunified, that they will reenter <laughs> the system within six months. Sometimes we do it within 12 months, depending on what that problem statement is. But nonetheless, this is a daily use dashboard. This dashboard is subject to change uh, every single day. Um, we monitor every probability. Uh, if the probabilities fluctuate, they're highlighted and staff is notified. Um, and so from this particular dashboard, we might be able to navigate, select a child, perhaps I want to add some increased oversight, perhaps I want to do a supplemental review. We'll talk about that uh, in Brian's presentation, but this would be an example of a worksheet that is used by that quality assurance staff. And if I wanted to then gain some additional visibility by navigating into that. So we've got these tools that allow you to see some of the outputs from the predictive modeling at the individual child level. So we said before that this model produced some, some uh, attributes that indicate poor interactions with the case. Here is an actual uh, child who is flagged with a high probability of failing. We can see what the current interactions of the caseworker are with the case. That scatter plot here on the upper right-hand corner is showing frequency of visits, late visits, um, with both the child, uh, with the biological mother. We're looking at supervisory reviews, how frequently they're happening. If you look further right below that table, you can see things like late uh, case notes, copied case notes, things of that nature. And we actually plot that out uh, every single day that child was known to the department. So there's some detailed lists here. So if the uh, recipient of this information wants a deep dive on why, uh, why was this child flagged, what are the details behind that, these are the kind of tools that they can use. Now, um, just to zoom out and look at uh, this particular model over 12 months, we do rolling predictions, predictions every day, and obviously children are, are set to be reunified. New children can hit that list. So what we've got here is just a breakout month over month, how many predictions we uh, had on those dashboards, new predictions, unique children that were likely to fail. So you can see we predicted about an average of 18 children to fail 
uh, per month. And in this particular jurisdiction, there were 900 plus reunifications, of which 104 actually did fail. So that's about a 10 to 11 percent failure rate. And again, at the end of the 12 months, this is an example. This is actual data, actually. Uh, which is showing each individual child that did re-enter the system. And the ones in yellow are the ones that we had predicted to fail as that, those rolling predictions were occurring. So at this point, you can see, uh, and to use some terminology mentioned by Andy, that's an 87% true positive rate. And so what do we do from this perspective? What do we do now? As we're highlighting these children uh, that, that are likely to fail in any problem statement, um, Perhaps if I were to apply some type of fidelity monitoring, apply some quality assurance process, could I take these children as they're being predicted and change that trajectory and improve that particular uh, outcome? In this case, we, we see upwards of a 10% improvement in re-entries into care. And what we're seeing now over the, uh, this current 12-month uh, period is about anywhere from 5 to 7% within a 12-month period of improvement using these type of tools. So, uh, so the children that are reunified would be the denominator. The numerator is how many children actually re-entered within a certain time frame. So in this particular model, uh, the state of Florida uh, indicates a failed reunification if that child re-enters within 12 months. So what we're seeing right now is an improvement. In this particular model, okay, we have predicted 87 of those 104 failures. So if we were to take action on those as they were being predicted, the improvement could be upwards of 10%. Okay, so this was a, a set of test cases we did on live data for 12 months uh, in 2014. So now we've deployed this for daily use at various jurisdictions, and we're actually seeing an improvement of anywhere from, uh, it actually fluctuates between 4 and 7%. But based on this testing data, we should be able to move upwards to 10% over 12 months. Go ahead. Okay. So at, at this point, I'll hand it over to Brian. I think that, um, you know, what we'll hear is, is now that we've got these tools in place, we've got them operationalized, how do we use them, and what kind of processes can we put around them? Before you go on, yep. you've got probabilities of failure. So um, probabilities can range from zero to 100. What, what's, your, what's your threshold for failure? Greg, before you answer that, for the people who are watching live, could you restate the question in a manner that uh, more briefly describes what you're going to answer? Sure. So okay. in this question, uh, each individual youth is getting um, a probability. So if you look at this particular example, you can see um, it ranges all the way almost to 100%, but never goes below 50%. Now, we have the opportunity to show every single youth, every single child who's set to be reunified is subject to get a probability. On the dashboard, uh, we're showing everything above 50%. However, and, and you may hear this from Brian, or users of these particular dashboards can look at the entire um, gamut of those particular children, look at below the line uh, from zero all the way up to 100. So it really is up to the folks who are implementing these predictive models what they want to look at. In this example, this dashboard is showing everything above 50%. Before I turn it over to Brian, any other quick questions? We do have question uh, session. Yeah. Um. Often when we talk about predictive analytics, we think about attributes of the case or the family. But it's clear to me by what you've just described that you're looking at attributes of the casework as well. What's happened in the case? Can you give me the balance between what contributes to a prediction of failure? Is it lots of evidence of weak casework or attributes of the individual family? Great, great question. Um, you can see the attribute ranking from this particular model. Uh, not all of it is about casework, and some of it is not even systemic. You know, we get disability uh, showing up high on that, right? Um, although that's not a bad thing in terms of identifying that because a system of care might create a different program to deal with disabilities if they're seeing that that's a problem. However, we're looking at all the data that, that 
make sense to the model. The model will tell us you know, what data is having an impact and what is not. And so we ran this in a single jurisdiction, which is about 3,500 children. And if we did this in a different jurisdiction, that attribute ranking is quite different. In this example, we're seeing that there might be some issues with casework, okay? And that's not always the case. Um, oftentimes, there are other attributes that rank up in the top one, two, three, four, five, which are not related to caseworker interactions and that sort. So this is just one example. Yeah, other attributes on both. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not just what's around the family, but also what they're experiencing the In some jurisdictions, we have the opportunity to look at not just uh, data from the case management system. In this case, we are, and we're dealing with children that are in the system receiving services set to be reunified. In child fatalities, when we're looking at investigations, we have an opportunity to, if, we, if we're given access to the data, we can look at investigative activity. Um, so you might see something similar that you're seeing here with casework versus investigative work. Uh, education details and what's happening in the school. Uh, so again, these are subject to change based on one, what data we have access to, and two, what's happening in that particular jurisdiction. And we are very uh, specific about doing the predictive modeling on a small jurisdiction in Florida countywide. Even if we're at a state level, we're trying to break it out into different zip codes or different regions. Um, we're just finding better performance when we deal with a localized group of data. So I want to add that that's very important. There, I've done this in a couple of states and in a lot of jurisdictions within those states, and the heterogeneity is huge. So there's a lot of variation in the factors that, that go into these models and what's important. And that's very instructive for the people on the ground. And the other thing I want to add to that is that when we start to use these and we start to apply interventions that change things, these systems can turn on a dime. Uh, if, if you actually flag for them that particular workers with particular caseloads are leading to a lot of reentries, that can change overnight. And so you need to have the model update with it. So these products out there that you think you're going to use for years, that it doesn't work that way. You've got to rebuild the model all the time. So Brian, go ahead. OK, so <clears throat> having heard from um, Greg and Andy about um, how we get the list, I'm going to try and talk to you today about, OK, now that you have the list of cases that you want to handle differently, what is it that we do? Because if all you have is that list, what you've really just done is bring the train that's coming at you on the track in bold relief. So um, we have in uh, Hillsboro, sorry, Um, we in Hillsboro have taken the approach that we want to apply quality assurance to these cases and a second set of eyes. Um, we have not said, oh, this child is on the list and just told everybody this kid is predicted to have poor outcome. Um, and in the five states where we are working, um, we are also taking the same approach that we're applying a second set of eyes through quality assurance to these cases. We're doing that because we have found that if you simply tell someone, oh, it's got a high score, They'll either uh, disregard that information because they already have a bias formed about the family, or they'll rely upon it too much. And uh, our intent is not in to uh, have this process supplement or to sorry um, eradicate human decision making, but instead just act as a support to it. And you know, um, uh, and for that reason, we want to uh, simply apply a quality assurance lens to these cases, and that's what we've done uh, in Hillsborough and the five uh, subsequent jurisdictions. So um, in Hillsborough, folks may know that um, when um, we took over that contract in July of uh, 2012, Eckerd did so from a prior provider that had had nine child uh, homicides uh, in open case management cases in less than three years. Um, that's really an unprecedented pattern. Um, not just because of the type of death, this was not a rollover or drowning cases, but in fact homicides, one child was thrown onto the interstate. 
but also because these were open case management cases. This was not an investigation that had closed. This was not um, a child not known to the department, but in fact, open co court supervision was present in a mix of direct file dependency and also post-placement supervision um, during that time. So the heaviest arm really of the state being involved in many cases, weekly visits happening in these homes, and yet we still had the fatalities happen. So beyond identifying the cases that were, that, um, were likeliest to have poor outcomes, we also wanted to change the trajectory of those cases. And the reason we did that through quality assurance, interestingly, is that the current secretary of the Florida Department of Children and Families was at the time the regional manager in the Tampa area. And he was sick of reading post-mortem, literally post-mortem case reviews where the um, reviews were the same, case after case. The profile of the kids was the same and the casework lapses were the same. And his quality assurance reviewers were writing these reports that he said he could simply, he could, he could write before he opened them, um, that, that the problems were the same. And so um, what Eckert decided to do when we took over was we wanted to take a look at those cases and find out what were the lapses in casework that we needed to fix. But we also went ahead and looked at every single case that was open because we knew that there were problems that needed to be rectified in those cases. And we also thought they would give us greater insight into the things that we needed to change about the system. And so we actually reviewed 1,500 cases and found an additional 200 safety concerns, ticking time bombs that were waiting to happen, um, waiting for a poor outcome to happen that needed to change. Interestingly about those 200 safety concerns, however, is that they were really variations on about 10 themes or less. Um, things like uh, safety plans that were not tailored to individual circumstances, um, home, st home studies and background checks that were originally pretty good but not updated. Um, so every we check everybody's backgrounds, but then when the sex offender boyfriend moves in, we don't, we don't re course adjust. Um, behavior change poorly monitored with um, providers, so accepting um, certificates, certificates of completion rather than understanding behavior change. Basic blocking and tackling issues that we decided to narrow into a, a 10, actually a nine question to, tool. And we apply that tool to all of the cases that we identify as being high risk. And then we have a staffing with the caseworker if any issues are found that are a problem. That staffing is designed to be a coaching model, peer to peer, non-punitive, and we require the case manager um, or the investigator in the other states that we're working with to come up with the solution to the issue that's been identified. Um, we then track that to uh, completion to ensure accountability. And um, we've seen really uh, remarkable uh, differences in casework. In Hillsborough, um, you can see our baseline was quite low on many of these practice issues, but we've seen on average 22% improvement over the first three years. Um, and we're hoping to replicate these results in other jurisdictions. And one thing I'll say about that, normally in QA, the, traditionally the model in child welfare has been we look at closed cases. We look at closed cases at random. And that model is fine for diagnosis, telling you what are some of the problems that are existing in your system. But it isn't curative. And we've been stuck on this sort of um, loop of insanity where we do case review after case review after case review, diagnosing the same problems over and over and over again. It'd be like if you broke your arm and you just kept going back to have x-rays every few weeks. Um, our model is not about finding the problems. It is about finding the case that is likely to have the poor outcome and acting on it too. Quality is jointly responsible, coming alongside the frontline worker and acting as a support to them in order to assist them in achieving a new and different outcome, rather than telling them ex post facto, here's how you've messed up. That fundamentally changes the nature of how quality is seen, much for the better, 
And it also provides to the frontline workers a sense of, I'm not in this alone when I'm making these tremendously difficult decisions. And so whether or not my case was identified by predictive analytics or some other method is probably less important to me than someone coming alongside to me and helping me in my hardest case achieve a different outcome. And that's why we use this coaching model rather than simply sending out a score. It's a very different approach that I want to just draw out for, for the crowd here. Um, right now we're working in Connecticut, Maine, Oklahoma, and Illinois on preventing um, fatalities and near fatalities. In Alaska, we're also working with them to prevent um, repeat maltreatment in early childhood. We are live in uh, four, of as of this week, we are live in four of those five states. We are hoping to be live uh, by the end of June in Connecticut. Um, I, when Maura introduced the panel, she said, you know, is this a cure for cancer? I don't think so. I don't think this is a silver bullet. I think this is a tool that we need to see as a way to improve our casework alongside other reforms. Um, but we do think that it's promising. And we are um, working with Casey Family Programs on an evaluation in um, four of the five states to see if we can replicate the results that we've had so far. There were a lot of things that happened in Hillsborough alongside the introdu an introduction of this pro uh, process, um, not least of which is the fact that the lead agency changed uh, contracts and we did a number of reforms alongside it. So we will see if this promise holds true in the other uh, five states we are working with. Um, Greg spoke to some of this, but what is needed in order to replicate is a defined problem statement. So, um, and that can be redefined through the process as um, we, as the data tells us that it, perhaps it should be. But the state needs a specific problem that they want to solve. For example, children um, at, who've already had an abuse report having a fatality within 12 months or 18 months or ever. All of those questions will in fact change the cases that are looked at by the models and yield uh, different results. So the state has to have an idea as to what problem it's trying to solve. Um, the hardest thing, without a doubt, has been getting access to the SACWIS data of various states. Um, in one case, that took nine months. Um, <laughs> the timeline of the child welfare, especially if the um, agency um, that manages data is not the child welfare agency because you will have the timeline of the child welfare agency being urgent and on board and the timeline of the data agency being the timeline of the data agency. Mm -hmm. And so um, if that, they are not the holders of the key, you need to understand that there's a process that has to be gone through, which is for a, a number of uh, important reasons. And um, you know, Greg navigates that process, but sometimes we're all just waiting uh, for quite some time. We also need to look at uh, fatalities, um, quality assurance products, other uh, system um, analyses that have been performed by the jurisdiction to align with um, our tool. Are the safety issues in this uh, jurisdiction the same as those that we had in Tampa, or are they slightly different? And we found that they're, they tend to be slightly different, although there tends to be some commonality across states. Um, and as Greg already uh, mentioned, this is not limited to fatality or near fatality. We can look at other stubborn child welfare problems, um, including um, reentry, which is something that we're looking at now in Tampa. And with that, I'll turn it over for questions. Okay, we have plenty of time, but if you would hold your questions or if you have not thought of one, if you would think about it, I'm going to ask some of the panelists some questions that I, I hope are informative in the overall picture. First of all, Andy, you have explained you know, on other occasions um, a process of predictive analytics utilized in another field, the medical field. I think it'd be instructive for the audience to hear that comparison to understand 
that this really has some application to the child welfare field as opposed to the health field. Right, and, and, uh, and the health field gets at least close to the human services field that we're in, and it's not as distant as, say, you know, predicting movie recommendations. Um, so the, um, I think the big piece we're lacking of this, I think we have a lot of the technology here, the tools to do the predictions, but we don't have the technology to communicate the prediction to the user, to the uh, frontline worker, whomever has to interpret this. Um, the, what the model is actually using to predict these events is tremendously complicated. Uh, and I, I would posit that the rarer the event, the more complicated the chain of events that leads to that event. So causal chains get longer and longer as the events get rarer and rarer. Um, so the easy ones, you know, like predicting uh, permanency within 12 months, okay, I can do that 99% of the time from the removal data. Um, that's, that's easy, but child fatalities, whoa. Uh, that's a very long causal chain. You're gonna need, uh, I, you know, use the number that a lot of the models that I've done for fatality run around 30 or 40 variables interacting with each other in a very complicated way that's hard to understand. So the, the only tool that I've been able to identify to communicate this kind of complexity is something IBM's been working on. So with, with their uh, Watson project, um, Watson, the computer that played Jeopardy, went back and read 50 years of medical literature and now helps to instruct medical students at the Cleveland Clinic on diagnosing. So the, the medical student has a, has a tablet and takes a history from the patient and while they're taking the history, Watson is out there churning through everything that it knows and looking for a diagnosis and then coming back to the, the med student's tablet and showing them the various paths by which they could get to one of maybe three different diagnoses of disease. And those are complicated paths, and it can show them visually, and it can show them, in, in our world, it could show us where the risk was. We can look for wider and narrower paths of risk. We could communicate these cases to a, an intake worker in terms of a visual of where the risk is in this case. And it's tremendously complicated. A probability or any kind of a score does not get that across. Um, the psychometrics of that, uh, user interaction with that is terrible. Uh, I don't think we should use scores. I, I think we should use something much richer. There's a lot of information in these models. We can communicate it. It needs some work, though. And, and Greg, the, the graphs that you showed that had some very detailed information, the, the probability of, of uh, failure, uh, who do you suggest uses that dashboard or that report, and what kind of training does it take to understand that? Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, what we're hearing from Brian and the rapid safety feedback process is a good answer. Um, <clears throat> Probably not the frontline staff, probably not yeah. your caseworker in the field. Uh, they're not, I mean, certainly the tools I showed beyond that where you navigate into a case and you can see some of the potential issues and look at certain things that are coming up in case notes. Supervisors could look at that. Even caseworkers could look at that. But the, the folks that are going to interpret that probability uh, and make determinations of what cases perhaps to, to select for additional review would be a quality assurance team, uh, which is a layer above, uh, a layer of uh, increased oversight, probably above supervisors in, in that case. I would, I would uh, look to Brian to, to comment on that too. Okay. Yeah, we deliberately are working with um, small teams. So okay. one of the things, you don't have to, um, although Andy's comments are very interesting about depicting the why visually, um, and so we'll have to follow on about that. But. Um, we have had we have taken the approach of saying this case has been identified for review we have some questions working on doing our absolute best case work something we'd want on all of our cases 
on these. And then we take a Socratic approach during the staffing around the things that we'd like to see to improve in order to change the trajectory of the case. Um, we found that works well. Um, we haven't had a lot of, hey, why is this case um, identified? Because when people get it identified, it makes sense to them at the gut level. Um, but uh, Andy's comments are interesting about the visual depiction. Yeah. And to both of you, the training issue, is this an extensive training for those who would use this predictive analytic concept? We, we do do an on-site training. Um, it's about three days. So um, fairly extensive then. Yeah, I want to ask Brian a question if I could. Sure. So um, in that training, there's, there's a set of tools. You've got the predictive dashboard. You've got the child trace sheets, the fact sheets that, that let you drill down and see what the model has found. What, can you talk about the, the difference between training on the technology components and versus training on the fidelity monitoring uh, and review process? In other words, what, how, how complicated or intuitive are the technology components? The technology components are intuitive. And in yeah, fact, um, because it comes to the case worker as, as a prioritized list, basically, or sorry, the case reviewer as a prioritized list, um, we, we haven't spent a lot of time, nor have we received a lot of questions around the why. Um, we spend more time, okay, now that you have this, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to move case practice? Um, what's the resistance that you will experience? How are you going to communicate this to the field? Um, all of that has received much more attention and been much more the interest of the implementing states. Okay. So time for questions, and uh, uh, sir, I saw your hand up. As, as you think of your question, as you're ready, if we can get you the microphone, and if we're unable to do that timely, then we will try to repeat the question so that um, those watching uh, and participating can hear it also. Sir. Uh, yes, John Shimano with the Child Welfare League of America. Uh, so you've talked about uh, in terms of instructing staff and maybe making some adjustments in terms of their uh, actions. Uh, I actually have kind of two questions. One is, does that have an impact on the actual staffing, whether it's caseload supervision or training, whatever? The second question is more about the more globally. So you showed a chart of likelihood of reentry. Are there things in there that you see maybe if it's a 13 or 14 year old entering with a behavioral health issue that you've also been able to change policy in terms of more globally for the agency or? Is it just focused on the specific case work? Um, so we have been focused more on the individual uh, case work. Um, and uh, what was the first question? I'm sorry again. In terms of the actual staffing impact. Impact of staffing yeah. and supervisors particularly. So um, the review process is focused on not just the investigator or the case manager, but the supervisor as well. And we have seen um, improved timeliness and improved quality of supervision alongside um, our review process. We have not gotten into um, changing models, changing staffing patterns, um, any of that. Not that that is something that we would necessarily think is a bad idea. It's just not something that we've done. And the second question. I, let me say one more thing. Um, I think it would be a mistake to just say, okay, we're going to assign a more experienced caseworker to these cases. Um, we think uh, or um, add more policies or procedures or requirements to these individual cases. Um, we think that that would reinforce this uh, that we would see, we would not see the practice change. We think it's absolutely critical to have the second set of eyes, the person who is not assigned the case, the person who is not formed a bias about whether or not this case um, is on the right trajectory, wrong trajectory. We've seen with um, actuarial tools that um, have been developed that people will reverse engineer them in order to uh, justify their bias. So by, by taking the identification of the case's risk level um, off that plate just for this particular supplementary review process and then introducing the second set of actors and the second set of eyes, we think we have somewhat of an antidote to that bias, confirmation bias issue. And so we think that's in terribly important. 
And the second part of the question, as I understood it, sir, was ha have you seen, for instance, the likelihood of reentry that there has been some impact in policy in other areas? No, um, but it's too, it's very early. The reentry thing is is very uh, recent. On policy, um, we, we did not change policies as a result of things that we have found here. That may be a reaction to um, the answer to every problem with the prior lead agency was a new policy. Right. Um, and we saw how that worked out. Right. Um, so, um, okay, we have a question way back there, please. Uh, Julie Klingenstein with the Andrew and Julie Klingenstein Family Fund. Uh, wondering about the data sources, whether or not any of the federally funded home visiting programs uh, where you've got uh, uh, people like Nurse Family Partnership uh, doing home visiting every two weeks in, a, in potentially high risk homes, whether those home visiting programs are part of the, uh, the data stream into some of these um, um, funnels? Not, not at this time. Um, there's no technical uh, limitation for that, but at the moment, the models that we've got implemented mm -hmm. are specifically related to the state SACWA systems, the child welfare systems, and other surrounding systems around that. In some cases, K through 12 education data comes in daily, uh, Medicaid data comes in uh, daily, and that's pretty much the scope thus far uh, in the models that we've got implemented. But, but we would like more more data sources I mean can you speak to the wide versus deep oh absolutely I think that you know in our case the the this whole thing is data driven the more data that we can bring in the more these machines will learn from uh, what's happening so you know the biggest uh, difficulty that we have is the depth and breadth of the data oftentimes like from a state SACWA system we can get 10 years worth of data if we need it but you know that's deep but not broad To add to that, when you're getting to the, K, the, 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 the public elementary data, uh, here you've got the first 60 months where, where the harm is being done and you've got an, an infant or, or even a chance to, to, to get involved in the, in the earliest of days. So I, I just put a strong push for home visiting as a, as a source. Perhaps this is an example of the prior question. Is policy changing as a result of this? And what is the local policy or state policy regarding the sharing of that data information that you've described into the SACWA system or alternatively access into the data base that, base that may exist? That may be the, the perfect policy issue, uh, looking at further um, information outside the traditional scope of information. Well, and to that, uh, I, I think that there's an opportunity here to use this as leverage to access a lot of those databases right. that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, I, got, I got carte blanche from our governor's office to, to practically any uh, database that the state had. And, and what, on my list was the home visiting data, um, but I, I haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, but and, and also to that that gap between birth and when we we have eyes on the child again when they come into school that's a critical period where we have just so little data on them so the first thing I went after was the birth record because there's there's a huge amount of information in that birth record right. uh, that indicates all kinds of great risk factors it also links to every other piece of data we have so it's a great starting point so I think that's the place to start but Filling that gap between zero and three when we don't have eyes on them, that's critical. And, and that also brings up, I think, an important point that still much of this is, is individually driven. So you in Georgia were able to access all of that information because of you, because of your content. Well, and it doesn't translate across states either. That's so when, uh, there is a standardized birth record, and I think almost all of the states are using it now. That's a good one. Uh, death records, no. Uh, there's a standardized record, but it's not across states. So I, I work in multiple states, so I do look for that. And I look for things that can translate. But yes, the fact is, I get access to this data just because of the relationships. Okay. There's a question over there, and then we'll come here, and then David. So back there first, please. Hi, I'm Sharon Vandeveer from Child Trends. Um, I'm curious about the skills and resources you actually need to implement the predictive modeling. And here I'm going to show my ignorance about machine learning. But is it 
a model or tool that you've developed that that it, that could be implemented in a fairly automated way in another location, or do you need a team of people um, who are writing detailed code and modifying the code on a daily basis, or could you give some sense of that? Sure. How about I'm, both of those, yeah. Yeah, so. All of the above. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll say is that there's, in every implementation, there's some data scientists that are working on the data. But if we have a model, um, in the case, for example, the states that uh, Brian mentioned, the five implementations of rapid safety feedback, we have uh, a model that we, we understand and we know works. So we don't have to start that from scratch, but every jurisdiction has different data. Mm -hmm. Every jurisdiction has different weighting. So when we apply the algorithms to a new set of data, even though it's the same predictive model, there's, there's new features and different features that have to be engineered. Um, this data science process has to be uh, manual with regard, at least in our case, manual with regard to the data scientists who tweak those uh, parameters to get the model to produce. And we can tell if it's, if it's producing, so we work that in every jurisdiction or I should say, in every net new data feed. Did you have more? But, yeah, but the models do translate well, I think. Uh, they're, uh, once they're set up and they, they are automated, and that is one of the great advantages of this, and there's less art in it than there, there was in the previous iterations of these types of models. So uh, I, I do think it translates, and that's, that's why I emphasize the metrics as well. Justice Corrigan, and then Mr. Sanders. Oh, but wait, uh, th it is a very specialized skill set, right? So we know the, the top job right now is data scientist, I think. For this. I have two questions, follow-up. First of all, uh, I believe it was Brian mentioned the utilization of predictive analytics in caseworker turnover issues, and as anyone who's run one of these systems is aware certainly one of the biggest problems that we face is worker turnover and how we stabilize the system nationally with you know 20 to 40 percent numbers of turnover every year um, so how how do you see that unfolding and what can you tell us about that issue one or any panelist and the second issue I have is the problem of um, that you mentioned of delay in access to data. And my question is, is that just a bureaucratic problem? Is it a problem of confidentiality and getting approvals from governor's offices? Or it, my question is, is there a legislative solution to the bar on access in any way? Or ha have you thought through that? So two-part two question. First caseworker turnover. Okay. So with respect to turnover, a couple of things I could say. One, um, we haven't had a, uh, we have not seen an improvement or decline in turnover um, associated with this process. Um, but we do see it as somewhat of a um, mitigating uh, influence on turnover in that if you have new case workers who are being assigned to these difficult cases, who is coming alongside them in order to help them make these decisions. Um, the second thing is that we are actually, we have approached Greg about doing a model specific to turnover and actually telling us who are the caseworkers who we think are about to turn over, um, what does that look like, and how can we apply this process to that problem, which is influencing so many outcomes. You know, we were blown away when we saw that in the top five attribute ranking on returns to care, that that system variable was present. And was it was concerning, obviously, to us. You would expect some of the other variables, like multiple reunifications, you would, ex you would have expected that. And we would have expected caseworker turnover to matter, but not that much. Um, so uh, a comment there. On Access to data, um, you know, I think the answer to your question, which was, is it um, bureaucratic or is it confidentiality, is yes. Um, Greg actually has done the nuts and bolts of the data exchange, so I'd, I'd be interested in hearing his comments on that. 
Yeah, well, first of all, it's different everywhere we go. It would be great if there was some type of standard, I, uh, but there isn't. And I think there's security governance differs from state to state. And so sometimes it could be a quick process, sometimes it could be very complicated. Um, but my question was, is there a legislative solution, let's say around the area of child deaths? So could there be a national solution to allow data access in, in this area? Or you know, is, is there something we could propose to get at the multiplicity of standards? Sure, but there's something very important here. There's national archives that, that we can get access to, but remember, in the implementations we do, we need to get approved for that daily access, right? And, and we've had an easier time getting historical data as a one-time you know, historical drop of the data so we can go and do our development work. It, it's more difficult to get that daily feed approved. That's a different issue, I suppose, for the jurisdictions. You know, we... we uh, I, it would be great to think that there could be some legislative process to make that happen. Um, we have to break down the barriers to data access uh, for this to really uh, change the landscape. But um, at the moment, we do it one at a time. So, so I have one legislative uh, proposal for you. The, 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 uh, the one that I ran smack into um, was I, in the child welfare side of the house and in, in other act data that I have access to, I have social security numbers. And uh, those are very, very useful for matching people up. Uh, I also have social security numbers in the birth records, but I'm not allowed to use them by federal law. Um, I think that's something that we could change. Uh, I think I ought, we ought to have some sort of a universal identifier. Uh, I negotiated with the lawyers that perhaps we could use some permutation of the Social Security yeah. number. Uh, just the last four digits would do it. Uh, and they were fine with that. So we've, we have, I think we have data out there uh, that we've unnecessarily restricted. And then the other thing is, um, in ongoing conversations with the Administration for, for Children, Youth, and Families at DHHS about um, how do we uh, uh, control levels of access and provide richer data sets to researchers, but also to um, people who are working on the modeling. Um, that, we can do that. And, and the, the technologies are there, privacy protecting, um, linkage. Uh, that, that we can do that. Um, so technology can help here a lot too. And, and next week there's going to be a big forum on that. And then I, th I think that as we move from SACWIS to what is called CWIS, uh, in the regulations they may, they may be encouraged to use a single identifier as Andy just described. Mr. Sanders and then the gentleman back there and then sir I saw your hand also. Justice Corrigan asks part of my question, but Brian, can you say a little about the interaction between the quality assurance staff and the social workers? How directive are they? Do they replace the role of supervisors? Do What changes with the supervisors? So they're deliberately non-directive. Um, the, the concept of the staffing is to elicit the problem that we are concerned with on the case and get the supervisor and frontline worker to understand that that is a problem and have them offer the solution. Um, we think that that is the way that we'll get transfer of learning onto other cases that might not be identified. And we've also found that there's better buy-in if they say that the safety plan needs an external monitor than if we say go get a safe, uh, external monitor for your safety plan. Um, and we believe that is why this has been embraced by the field rather than um, resisted. Question way in the back. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is uh, Brett Brown from ACYF, and uh, I had a question about the linked databases. As you know, those can take, <clears throat> those are great for this kind of predictive work, but they take a very long time to construct and to get all the agreements in place and all the technical years very often, right? So, and so I think that using predictive analytics to promote this development is good, but I think maybe looking at the other way and saying where are the states and communities that already have well-developed systems that we can take maximum advantage of now for developing the most complex and complete models? So uh, what thought have you given to that and where would you all point 
your finger to is having where the most promising uh, linked administrative databases around the country. Um, well, I work with South Carolina quite a bit, and they have a data a centralized data warehouse uh, that they've amassed over years, and it's all linked together. So that's very handy, um, and they're they're small enough that it's it's manageable as well. Um, beyond that, I I can't point to anybody in particular. Allegheny, excuse me. Allegheny, maybe. Yes, well, there's Allegheny County. Yes, they, they yeah, 20, 20 or thirty years worth there. I, say, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I don't have complete information, but I do know that the Urban Institute uh, has a project going on right now that's being funded by the Annie Casey Foundation where they're working with about seven communities uh, to, to develop or make use of linked administrative data systems around child welfare issues. So that's Yeah, I think there are opportunities yeah. out there for that, and I, 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 yeah, let us know. I, yeah. And we had a question here, sir. Other questions? Uh, sure. My name is uh, Mike Webb from Arlington. I uh, just had a question in terms of the data that uh, is available. Is it in digital form and in digital form, is it transferable into your system? The data that we get is usually um, database uh, backups, daily backups, or in some type of format where we can consume it directly in. And at worst case, we're one day behind the live uh, state system. So it's uh, very transferable. Uh, we design it that way, right? So when we go to a jurisdiction and talk about the data requirements, one of the things that we uh, establish right up front is, one, is the data to support the problem statement available, and can we access that in a daily type of a feed? So there is uniformity between the state in terms of how that data thing actually is uh, compiled? To some degree. Okay. I mean, there's small variations. Um, obviously, the data formats are likely very different, um, but the, the protocol, the exchange protocol, the data exchange is, is very similar. Other questions? As you think of one, I will throw one out. We, you, you have very um, well pointed out the issues that um, support predictive analytics. One of the criticisms or concerns is that it has the possibility although the critics talk about the probability that this will become the answer, that a predictive analytics report or conclusion will be the, the, the approach that's taken. First of all, do you agree with that? And secondly, how would you avoid that? How would uh, a, a, a local system avoid having that answer? And I think, Andy, you mentioned that numerical answer be the answer rather than continuing to use critical thinking, teaming, and other things. Yes, I think that's my approach to it, is that you give richer data. Uh, and and it's, it, uh, the criticism that we're, uh, we're basing this on historical data and we, you know, we don't want to necessarily repeat the past uh, is, is valid. But the, I think the way to see through that is to be able to get that rich look at the prediction that's being made and figure out uh, what with what pieces of the system perhaps are driving that, and then you correct it. it it's uh, you know in order to correct it, it's got to be in there in the model. I think. Uh, I would respond that um, no, I don't agree with it, but I do think it depends on the intervention. So you know, in our case, the intervention is that somebody else looks at the case and makes sure we're doing our best work. Frankly, something that you would want on all of your cases if you had the resources to do it. We are simply using this to prioritize those those ones that can get that second set of eyes um, in order to uh, change the trajectory of the case. So I think, and in fact, can act as a, a, a bulwark against uh, bias um, because you have four people looking at a case, not one, um, and four people with uh, in different lines of authority with um, who take an independent review on their own. So, so what we're really talking about is a real fundamental change. And we know that there are only three people who like change. Uh, a baby with a wet diaper, <laughs> someone with a flat tire, and someone standing in front of a vending machine. <laughs> so, so recognizing that, that resistance to change, uh, the argument I think I've heard about predictive analytics is that it may go well when caseloads are at a good norm and things are progressing fairly well. It is when 
high turnover, as was mentioned, occurs and other things that all of a sudden this becomes the answer. And is there a suggestion of how to prevent that from happening? Um, and one would suggest that it's primarily leadership of an agency and then operationalizing. And you, you, Greg, used the word operationalizing this. But in that context, how do you assure or how would you propose to assure that this doesn't become, as Andy's described, the answer? Well, let me comment about that for a second because, you know, the feds, the states, the we're bent on getting data into the system, right? We're mandated to get data into the system. We've been to just about every jurisdiction across the country and have never come across a jurisdiction that is not data rich. But almost all of them are information poor, right? So we're mandated to get the data in, but what are we doing with it once it's in there? And I think when we talk about this paradigm shift, we have to embrace some technologies that let us get that data out and extract mm -hmm. that intelligence and make good use of it. Predictive analytics is a decision support uh, for those who are going to employ some type of a practice. Um, it's a decision support into that practice. And, and predictive analytics is not the only one that can operate on the data. Um, we talked earlier about different data analytics. We talked a little bit about, you know, dashboards and views and tools we showed some today that aren't related to predictive analytics, but just simply visibility. We have to get used to figuring out better ways to unlock that data that we've been mandated to put somewhere. Yeah, making use of it. Um, I, I don't have a solution, but I can tell you that I have been pushed around by the reactive nature of the system. Right. Uh, and, and it comes back to that narrowing down very, very specifically what it is I'm trying to predict. And that can change in six months easily uh, based on the winds. And, and I don't have a good solution for that. Okay. We have time perhaps for one more question. Um, they, oh, oh uh, you've already had one, Jason. How about if we come over here? And if the question's simple and the answer's simple, we can get to you. Hi, Laura Radel with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we've talked around this some, but in, in this system, as everyone in this room is aware, child welfare is a field where we're balancing a lot of different things. And when we squeeze one place, something else happens. And I'm thinking particularly of the example you all were talking about with reunifications and failed reunifications. And when I think about how would I do something differently as a caseworker, on the one hand, you can look at doing something differently with the family to make a reunification stick safely. On the other hand, you could have not reunified in the first place, and if you never reunify, you never have a failed reunification. <laughs> but that has costs, and costs to families, costs to the system. And in, as we think about how to use these new tools, how we build that in, and is that about how we use your quality assurance system? Is that something that the models can help build in? How do we think about those kind of counterbalances in this very complex system where getting one thing right means that sometimes we get another thing wrong? I can speak to that one. Um, so as we are looking at this um, failed reunification issue in particular, we actually chose to do the review following reunification rather than prior to it. Um, in Florida, we have a six-month post-placement reunification period um, that's mandatory, and we are using this to see how we can strengthen the reunification in a few uh, rare circumstances, maybe reconsider it. But in general, we decided to time the review that way. We could have chosen to time it prior to the reunification, but, in, but we made that choice partly because of the, the, what you're describing um, right now. Um, timely reunification is very important to us. We actually achieve a, a uh, we exceed the federal standard quite significantly, actually, in the systems of care that we operate. Um, but I do think we have to think about unintended consequences. Um, that's something that we're looking at in the evaluation. For example, are we having more children enter care um, as a result of states implementing this in investigations? Um, we haven't seen that so far, um, that particular outcome. Um, but it's something that we want to guard against and, and, and be careful of. If those are children who should have entered the system, that is one thing. Um, but if they are not, then that's uh, something that we, we will continue to monitor and look at. I think we have time for one, one last question. Thank you. Um, the two parts of predictive analytics is the quality of the data going in and then the use of the data. Back to the first one. 
thinking about the data that you have access to, from your intuition, what piece of data or what kinds of information would make the most difference in improving the, uh, the results of your analytics if you could have access to it and you don't currently? Uh, for, for me, it would be um, environment. Uh, if we could add a zip code to every one of the records, um, I can then access uh, about a thousand census variables and mm. tell you a lot about the environment. And I've done that, and uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, predictive uh, um, factor. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I guess that's at the top of my list, and I don't have it in every state, and there's various rules around that uh, that restrict the use. Um, but I think environment, and, and then the linkage back to the birth record, I think that's very important. I agree with that. Nick, anything further? I, I agree with that completely. We're looking for the same data uh, in every implementation. Um, you know, I want to add, too, about data quality, you know, part of that uh, feature engineering and data prepping is to really identify issues with the data. So we go through this painful process of, of uh, you know, cleaning the data and, and a lot of the tools around the modeling will tell us that, you know, the data is not performing or certain data that we've brought in is not performing or it is performing. So there's that, that you know, process where we can weed out what's not working and keep what is working and that sort of thing. So just because the perfect data isn't available all the time doesn't mean that we can't make huge progress here. Can, can I just ask a follow-up on that? Why would the zip code not be in the SACWIS data? I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't have the zip code. Um, I, I suppose privacy, you know. Um, it, so in the uh, the data sets that are distributed by the National Data Archive, the county is even taken out, except in the very large counties. So zip codes, I assume they would do something similar. Um, so we'll have, we'll have many uh, cases of, of a single case in a zip code, and that's identifiable, perhaps. Perhaps we have someone in the audience or watching who can begin to address that, and I assure you that some of us will think about this and figure what we can do to communicate that. So um, I have some solutions. Yeah. Okay, good, good. <laughs> So um, in, in the last three minutes in, in legal field, uh, we would say any closing argument or discussion? Final words of wisdom for the audience? Don't use scores. All right. <laughs> Break down the barriers to data access. You know, add people into the process along with um, the, the predictive work because it's the marriage of the two that we think will achieve the results. Wonderful. Well, we've had a very rich discussion about predictive analytics. I hope that all of you feel that you are more prepared today than you were yesterday to listen to, to discuss, and support the issue of predictive analytics. We have a very important group coming up after this session who will talk as leaders, uh, national leaders of child welfare about their experiences and how predictive analytics may be a part of that. But we're going to take about a five minute break so they can get prepared and so that those of you watching or those of you participating can get some coffee or do something else. So would you join me then in thanking the group for their Five minutes now.
so we can get down. started. Terrible weather. And so now, hopefully, this year, I mean, they've got, they've got uh, not Katy Perry, uh, the other young woman coming, really one of the big stars. What's her name? I can't remember her name. But. So they're, they're, they're. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to ask everyone to t take their seats so we can begin our second panel. Thank you. Good morning again. My name is Maura Corrigan, a visiting fellow here <coughs> at the American Enterprise Institute, and I welcome you to our second panel of the morning. <coughs> which will bring the perspectives of child welfare leaders in our country um, around the execution, the opportunities, and the challenges involved with predictive analytics. Um, this morning, we're pleased to have representatives, uh, leaders from the state of Connecticut and Texas, and Dr. David Sanders of Casey Family Programs, uh, who has been the chairperson of the Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities. Uh, each one of the panelists this morning will speak for approximately 15 minutes. Um, I will then call on them to comment on each other's presentation, should they care to, and we'll open uh, the session for your questions and comments um, after 45 minutes. I will exercise the prerogative of the mod moderator to give a very short introduction of the panelists. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from the state of Connecticut, represented this morning by Commissioner Joette Katz and uh, Deputy Commissioner Susan Smith. Uh, Commissioner Katz and I, as I mentioned, uh, both are in the small club of former Supreme Court justices who ran department or run departments of human services or child welfare. Justice Katz was a uh, member of the Connecticut Supreme Court for 19 years before she stepped down in January of 2011 at the governor's invitation to run Connecticut's Department of Children and Families. Um, in addition to her service on the Supreme Court, she was an administrative judge for the appellate system. She served on numerous commissions and boards in her career. And I think she would agree with me, perhaps, that running a child welfare department in the executive branch is the hardest uh, job that we've ever had. Her colleague to her right, Susan Smith, is a graduate of Duke Law School. She's been with the Connecticut Department of Children and Families since 1995 with many responsible positions in that job. She has served to operate the systems of care, a uh, unit in Connecticut worked on procurement, quality, and planning, and currently she is responsible directly for the implementation of predictive analytics in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and so will you uh, join me in welcoming uh, Commissioner Katz, Deputy Commissioner Smith, who will lead off this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And in answer to Justice Corrigan's question, no contest. Hardest job I have ever had, and, and frankly, harder than I ever imagined. So uh, Susan and I are going to split our time. I'm going to be the skunk at the luncheon. Uh, and by that, I mean I'm going to identify some of the, the questions around the use of predictive analytics that I hear uh, buzzing around and hope what I and, and propose what I hope will be uh, some suggestions and solutions. The sky is not falling. So child protection efforts are complicated, as we all know, by the challenge of accurately assessing a child's future risk of maltreatment. Victims are frequently born into complex family environments with many risks, yet no single factor deterministically predicts maltreatment. Nonetheless, if we can early and accurately assess the likelihood that a child will be the victim of maltreatment in the future, obvious benefits will likely flow. Correctly assessing the likelihood that a child will be the victim of future maltreatment would enable scarce resources, certainly, to be strategically targeted, and an array of evidence-based programs could then be afforded to families with intensity and service levels tailored to maltreatment risks. 
today's symposium, this morning's panel, and the current panel, obviously, and its distinguished participants, strongly suggest that predictive risk models, that is what we call automated tools that gather and process information held to existing data sets in order to determine patterns and predict future outcomes, will go at least some way toward making such assessments possible. I acknowledge that the application of predictive risk modeling to child maltreatment brings ethical risks, costs, including the possible stigmatization of already vulnerable populations, predictable false positives, the use of data without consent, difficulties in designing and implementing effective interventions, and resource allocation issues. Not surprisingly, predictive tools have been treated with suspicion in the child welfare area and you all know whom I'm talking about. I'd like to identify some of these concerns, but merely as cautionary, because I also think that there are answers to them, and I am a big believer. But like anything else, the best tool in the wrong hands can have unintended consequences. So what are some of the issues? Well, some opposition flows from experience with operator-driven tools that were not properly validated for the populations to which they're applied. Some critics have argued that the use of automatic, automated prediction and surveillance tools in child protection may be positively harmful, in part, because they fear that such tools might overwhelm services with referrals. The basic problem, by magnifying the amount of data being collected so much that there's a risk that the case of serious abuse will be hidden in the deluge of data about lower level concerns. So it's sort of the needle in the haystack. And if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, is it wiser, is it wise to make the haystack bigger? Well, this needle in a haystack problem, I think, is one that arises for a wide range of referral strategies, not just predictive analytics. And whether it's a problem for predictive analytics will depend upon contingent implementation strategy, including, for instance, decisions around thresholds for referral. So from this perspective, it's hard not to think that there's a curious assumption behind the haystack metaphor. If we know that there are needles in the haystack, I think we should take no comfort from restricting the scope of the search. We need better needle detectors. A risk stratification tool that sorts cases by risk, I believe, would go a long way to addressing this need. Similar points can be made in response to other common criticisms of this tool. It's been suggested, for instance, that such technologies will lead child protection workers to thrust their computers aside rather than their own judgment and lead to the loss of universal child protection policies. But again, there is nothing in this tool that entails these sorts or dictates these results. These tools can never replace child protection workers or diminish the role for their judgment or engagement with families. I would suggest that it's better to leave the complex and time-consuming data collection and validation tasks to an automated system and its designers, obviously properly informed by social workers, freeing frontline staff to exercise experience and judgment in decisions about the proper response to validated risk assessments delivered by the tool. Remember, the beauty of the predictive analytics approach is that it relies upon routinely collected administrative data to exploit historical correlations and patterns for a specific population. Still another complaint is that it could lead to reliance on intensifying universal as opposed to targeted services. We already know that universal programs are expensive, and they would certainly be even more so if made more intensive. Given the relatively low incidence of serious child maltreatment, much of these added, added costs would then be directed to families whose children were not at elevated risk of maltreatment. For these families, there would be no gain in terms of reduced maltreatment outcomes from resources directed to them. And such an allocation would then mean fewer resources would be available to treat families whose children were at elevated risk. But again, you can never abandon critical thinking about what families really need. And I think we heard that this morning in terms of the use and reliance on our dedicated staff. Now, to me, perhaps the most concerning of all of uh, the, the rumors from the naysayers is the possible stigmatization of risk, of risk scored individuals and families. And this is a, a potentially troubling potential cost of the use of any tool. And there are a number of aspects to this problem. 
The burdens associated with identification as an at-risk individual or group certainly may increase the risk of the predictive adverse outcome, increasing pressure on already struggling families, reducing their readiness to engage with service providers, and leading professionals to engage differently with stigmatized individuals. The burdens that follow from being identified as a member of a group often rest on the false beliefs about what membership means. But while such stigmatization is ill-founded, it's no less onerous for those who bear it. The burdens of stigmatization furthermore often fall on those who are already the subject of social disapproval or demarcation, appropriating and reinforcing pre-existing stigma. But again, there are solutions. The most obvious way to reduce or eliminate stigmatization is to maintain careful control over the dissemination of the product of the tool. It is, of course, not possible to obtain the benefits of, of predictive analytics without at-risk families being identified at some point. But if intensive services are to be targeted, those in high-risk groups must be identified to at least the service providers. Such information should be disseminated as narrowly as possible, consistently with achieving the benefits of the program, and only with the level of detail required to make effective use of the model's predictions. Other consequences might be addressed by ensuring that the intervention is supportive and preventative rather than punitive. Another would be to change the label from high risk to high priority for services. Words matter. But I caution that change may require too much effort for the potential benefit when we think about all of our traditional and existing risk assessment tools. Another word of caution is to be vigilant around training to avoid confirmation bias, something that's very difficult, but I would suggest extremely essential. We also all worry about under-identification. In fact, that's why we get into this discussion to begin with. But what about over-identification? As regards false positive, which we, we heard about, the incorrect classification of families as high risk. One should reduce the false positive rate, for example, by choosing higher thresholds for intervention. Beyond this, one might reduce the ethical significance of false positives in the child maltreatment context by reducing the significance of the consequences of misidentification. Experienced child protection professionals must be able to exercise judgment about appropriate responses to a family's identification as being at risk, ensuring that such professionals understand the potential of the tool to miscategorize families, providing training to guard insofar as possible against confirmation bias in the professional engagement with families identified as high risk, offering rather than requiring engagement as a consequence of identification as at risk, ensuring that intervention triggered by identification is at risk is as non-intrusive as possible, consistent, consistent with the overall aims of reducing child maltreatment risk, ensuring that intervention triggered by identification as at risk is positive and supportive rather than punitive, and identifying and minimizing the adverse effects of identification as at risk, such as, for instance, possible stigmatization. And finally, there are legitimate concerns that this tool raises clear confidentiality issues insofar as it could generate risk predictions by drawing from databases that hold information gathered for purposes other than child protection, which would be assessed almost certainly without access, I'm sorry, most certainly without the consent or knowledge of those who supplied the information. Now, in Connecticut, we are still in our infancy on this project, and so I, I don't have anything more more concrete by way of advice, and I identify all of these issues, again, because I think there are concerns raised around them, but I suggest, once again, that there are solutions. And most of it really boils down to thought, acknowledgement, awareness, and being willi willing to wrestle with these issues as you roll your way out into this process. So a word of caution, and that's simply all it is for those of you who, who go down this road. I'm looking forward to future exploration of this very significant tool. I think, again, I've identified some of the concerns, but these are intended to be starting points, not discussion enders. And for me, like everything else, it's really about using information responsibly in conjunction with and not as a way of supplanting critical thinking that we require of our staff every day. And now Susan's going to tell you even more. Good morning, folks. I'm just going to punctuate some of the commissioner's comments with some specific details about how and why we've come to predictive analytics here in Connecticut, particularly um, through, through the Eckerd model. 
Um, some of the data that I'm going to go through very, very quickly, I think, helps to put into relief for us that this really hasn't been driven by a particular crisis or a series of, of fatalities, but really is the next step uh, in terms of the evolution of us, of, of, of Connecticut's Department of Children and Families. We get about uh, 90,000 or so calls a year. About 50,000 of those calls actually relate to abuse and neglect. Um, about 30 or so thousand, almost 30 or so thousand of those calls um, are actually investigated, and a fairly small small, about 17, 18 percent, about 5,300 uh, of those um, uh, subs of those actually uh, investigated reports um, are, are substantiated. Um, because Connecticut is a consolidated child welfare agency, um, we actually serve a, a large number of, of families. So we have legislative mandate for not only child uh, protective services, but uh, behavioral health services for, for children, uh, juvenile justice, as, as well as prevention. So on an, any given year, we um, serve about 33,000 uh, families, and we serve um, over 73,000 children. I'm going kind of quickly because I'm mindful of, of, of time. Um, You'll also see that of that 73,000 children that, that we serve, um, fatalities are thankfully a, a fairly rare occurrence. A maltreatment fatality is a fairly rare occurrence. And that's certainly not to negate uh, nor to diminish um, the, the impact and the tragedy, tragedy of even a single uh, maltreatment death. But, but fortunately for, for us, it, it is uh, something that is a fairly rare um, event. And we've been looking at this data going over the, the past uh, 10 or so years. And we've had about 96 uh, maltreatment identified fatalities uh, over that course of that period. Um, and, and actually, the majority of, of, of those are, are cases that had some prior involvement with the departments. Um, about 41 or so percent of those maltreatment fatalities um, were cases that, that had that uh, type of a, of a moniker. Um, about 31 or so percent um, of the maltreatment uh, deaths were cases that were not known to us. And about 30 or 28 or so percent of, of those maltreatment fatalities were, were actually uh, on, on open cases. So as I stated before, um, we haven't come by way of this uh, through, 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 through crisis. And, and this has been kind of a very slow and I think deliberative walk for us in, in terms of, of coming to uh, predictive analytics and really seeing it as, as the commissioner noted and I think Brian also stated, as, as a tool. And there was a lot of foundational work that, that's happened that I think has really put us in a good position in order to, to, to um, adopt and adapt uh, this for, for Connecticut. Um, we've identified some cross-cutting themes for ourselves as an agency, a couple which I think are really sentinel relate to us being a learning organization. So that really has really set us up over the years to, to think about data in a very different way. Uh, us being an accountable and transparent agency. Um, much of the data that I'm presenting today can actually be found on our website. We also, in the state of Connecticut, through an executive order, have an open data portal. And we put non-identifiable uh, data sets up, uh, many of them going back for, for a decade. So we invite uh, other folks to, to uh, help us and to look at the data and to support um, our, our determination of, of how to make uh, better outcomes. Um, and, and so those, those pieces really have been quite critical for, for, as I said before, kind of positioning ourselves to, to use predictive analytics in a way that, that makes good sense for us and really can be kind of a support to, to, to our staff. I'm not going to go into some of these other pieces related to the, our practice model and, 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 super, and supervision model. But again, I think that these were other components that were, were quite critical for us in order to, to be where we are to, to really embrace this in, in, I think, a meaningful way. Uh, some of our early endeavors, and this certainly isn't meant to, this isn't a predictive model by, by in, or any means, but, but some of our activities to use data, at least begin to use data in a more sophisticated way, at least for us, nascently began with using some projections and, and, and forecasting. Uh, so about four or five years ago, we really started to think about how could we use our data in a much more proactive way? How could we start to innovate, innovate that, that, that data to help us make decisions? And so the slide that I have up here um, are some projections that we've been doing to help us determine where kids are going to be oftentimes a couple years uh, in the future. And we have actually gotten to the place where we were quite comfortable with this data to start to actually make decisions about how to pivot resources. Um, when the commissioner started, uh, almost 30% of our kids in placement were in a congregate care setting. Uh, very few kids were in Ken placement, 19, 20, 21% at, at, at most. Um, over the course of the past four or five years, we've really been able to, to reverse that trend. So 
as of now, I think we have about 11.7% of our kids in placement in congregate, and over 41% of our kids are in Ken, and an additional 41 or so percent who are in uh, what we call core, core foster homes. So the majority of our children who are in care are in a family setting, which meant that our community services also needed to follow those children. And based upon those, uh, those projections, we felt confident that we could make those changes. So we didn't have to, to do it in a hasty way, but we, we had steadily um, been, been moving our, our resources in that way. So some of the, again, the, the, the work that we had done in terms of embracing a learning culture and really bolstering our, our, our data culture and environment, have, I think, have allowed us to, to start using this information in a better and a different way. Um, I think this kind of sets up for, a, so for a, another slide that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but we've also been in, investing and in looking at how do we um, impact in both the positive and a negative way um, disproportionality. So how are we contributing to disproportionality and then what do we need to do to, to, to abate it? Um, and so for the, the past three or four years, we've been developing these pathways, um, looking at who's coming into our care, who's, uh, who are the, what are the referrals coming to us, what's the distribution, and how does that relate to, to our, our, our population? I think like many jurisdictions, we, we too are plagued with this disproportionality and, and certainly some disparity. And uh, we wanted to be very thoughtful about how do we also think about this in terms of how we use our data and also how we um, are planning to um, implement predictive analytics. So some of what the commissioner talked about of some of the peril and concern was, was very much of, of, of something that we considered and, and really have been thinking about in terms of how is this going to look when we actually uh, go live with this um, in, a, in another hopefully month or, month or two. So some of the other work that, that we've also done has involved doing some in-depth studies. So I shared with you the slide of our data going back uh, 10 years. So in addition to just simply doing some, some nose counting, we actually did a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, case control review of, um, of fatalities that involved children zero to three. So we, we looked at um, any of our fatalities that involved those young children that had DCF involvement, as well as um, kids of that same age cohort where there wasn't um, a poor or fatal outcome to determine whether or not there were some statistical factors that might contribute uh, or at least um, be associated with an elevated risk for, for, a poor, for a poor outcome. So that's helped us to really helped us to really think about where do we need to focus this? What are some of the issues? Where are some of the, the, the pressure points? Um, and, and again, this has been related to some other work that, that we do in this arena, doing special qualitative uh, reviews um, of our fatalities and, and ongoing uh, data tracking. And, and, and that helped us to, to, to discern that we really needed to give our staff um, some tools and some assistance and support, and support in order to do prioritization. Um, folks know child welfare work is exceedingly complex. And our staff are doing a lot of this calculus in, in their head. And we thought we needed to give them some other resources and some other tools and allow them to really be able to figure out how to better focus some of their work and, and intervene with families in an individualized way with the, the intended purpose of changing their trajectory. Um, clearly, we wanted to be less react, reactionary, be much more proactive, and, and, and be more solution focused. And so for us, the predictive analytics feels like it is a contributor Contributing solution, um, you know, as we've all said, uh, trying to kind of temperedly, we don't think it's a panacea. We don't think of it as kind of being the the, the answer. Certainly, cannot supplant uh, the the judgment of our staff, but we see it as an aid to help our staff make good decisions and, and figure out what are the best means for for intervention and support. I'm going to go quickly because I'm mindful of, of, of time. Um, what you'll see here is just some of the, the, the checklisting, if you will, some of the inventory that, that, that we did to, to, to determine our readiness. Um, we felt that we needed to have a clear and firm mission, um, that we were really clear about what it, who we are as an agency and, and then how will predictive analytics particularly, potentially support us. You know, what are our values and commitment? As I stated before, disproportionality elimination was certainly one of those. Um, we've invested uh, quite a bit in, in, in racial justice and, and have a statewide work group that's uh, looking at, at things in, in, in that area. Um, we needed to make sure we had clear guiding principles. We needed to make sure just on a practical sense that we had the data that was needed and then we also had the undergirding of, of some of the Connecticut specific research to help to frame our problem statement. We needed to make sure that we had the technological infrastructure. So uh, both Greg and, and, and Brian and Andy talked about you know, some of the challenges that, that certainly can happen with
with respect to feeding the data and making that available. So we needed to make sure that we had those pieces in place. And we also wanted to make sure that, that we had the staff support. So on the technolo technological side as well, our Office of Research and Evaluation, um, on our quality assurance side, but, but also clinical. Uh, one of the, the, the ways that we're looking at actually implementing the qualitative review piece is having our staff who do that be licensed clinicians. So these are staff who work in our department but also have clinical licensure because our, some of our data from our research indicates that uh, some of the factors that, that uh, increase the risk uh, for a poor outcome are families that have fairly intractable mental health substance abuse issues, uh, issues with DV. So we wanted to have folks who could support um, our staff with making some decisions and identifying some solutions in, in, in that arena. One of the other things that we just absolutely, absolutely felt that we had to put in place was a clear and strong value statement. And this kind of goes back to some of what Commissioner Katz was, was, was detailing about the, the various perils and concerns that folks um, have identified. And I think, you know, certainly that we should be deliberative and we, we definitely need to, to be thoughtful about uh, how we approach this. And for us, um, we synthesized uh, five or so kind of core questions, uh, kind of, you know, that geek in me of, you know, kind of the Asimov rules of, you know, what are we, how are we going to do this? And, and, and how are we going to know when we're perhaps getting to a place that we're not comfortable with? So we've laid out that we wanted to make sure that first and foremost that it was advancing um, a legitimate um, and vital agency interest. Uh, that we wanted to make sure that it was an issue that could be abated or ameliorated. Um, we, we wanted to also be thoughtful about what the intervention was going to be and, 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 and how we would, we would implement that. Uh, we also wanted to be very, very thoughtful about that piece related to structural inequities and, and, and bias. And we know that some of the data is going to, historical data is going to have some of that in there. So that looking at our pathway slide, we know that African American and Hispanic children are more likely to be referred to the department disproportionate to their, their, their representation in the general population. Um, so that potentially, for a variety of reasons, some good, some bad, they're coming to the attention of the department, which means that they may have more reports. Um, and, and for other <coughs> decision point er pieces, they may have other, be deeper into the system th than others. And we need to, to, to think about that. And that, to me, is the partner about also ensuring that our staff um, are not using this to supplant their judgment, that we're tempered about this, and that they're also thinking about, OK, um, what, do, you know, what do I really understand about the Smith family? And, and, and I know this piece, but you know, what else do, do I need? You know, what else do I know about this family? Um, and, and just simply that we didn't want to in any way contribute to, to dis disparate impact and, 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 and profiling. So th those really for us have been just kind of cornerstones um, about how we're approaching this and also about how we're intending to think about it when we potentially go into other aspects of it, um, um, and which we'll see in the, the uh, last slide, is you know we're thinking about future applications, but obviously we want to get what we're doing um, related to fatalities and life-threatening conditions right, um, but we, we obviously want to do this in a way that, that's pretty measured and, and, and balanced and, and, and judicious, and, and as I stated before, and I don't think I can overstate, is that it really aligns um, with our values and, and, and our ethos. Um, we also want to make sure that our staff feel good about this. Um, what we didn't, what we don't, and the folks have our folks feel like this is another initiative, or this is something that's being forced upon them, um, and that this is someone else who's just looking over their shoulder. So we uh, have have done a lot of work about bringing in uh, staff um, at various aspects to inculcate them about this, to make sure they understand why we're doing this, how we're doing this, so that folks feel good about it and see it as a tool and a partnership, that they're, they're, they're not alone. So there's a lot of work that we've been doing to try to make sure that our staff at all levels uh, view this um, as, as, as a positive support and not this burden and yet another th thing I have to do or somebody who's, who's going to be looking over um, our, our shoulders. So that's a little bit about uh, how we've come to this and, and uh, what um, we've been thinking about in, in terms of getting to the place of, of, of implementing and operating this um, come this, this, this summer. All right. Thank you, um, Deputy Commissioner Smith and Commissioner Katz, for your excellent presentation. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite Dr. David Sanders um, to speak um, on this panel. 
Uh, Dr. Sanders is, of course, a visionary and respected leader in child welfare in the United States of America, and we're delighted to welcome him. He has been at Casey Family Programs since 2006, where he's the executive vice president with the lofty title of uh, Systems Improvement, um, and he also supervises public policy work for Casey. Prior to that, he might have had the toughest um, child welfare job in the country, and that would be running uh, child welfare in Los Angeles County, an enormously large system. Um, he just uh, helped to deliver the report of the uh, uh, Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities in mid-March, which um, is a, a tremendous work and does feature uh, uh, predictive analytics and a portion of the report discusses Hillsborough County, Florida, and what has occurred there. Um, I also want to point out that Wade Horn is a member of that commission and he's present in the audience this morning. So we're happy to welcome uh, Commissioner Horn as well to um, AEI. And then with no further ado, I'll call on Dr. Sanders for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Justice, and um, I'm going to try and be brief and cover three areas. One, I'll discuss my views of predictive analytics. Second, I'll talk about the, some of the findings, just very briefly, of the Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities, and then I'll, I'll close with some um, national examples. And I want to make sure mine is up. So I have my... Um, parents were from the rural south and so grew up in a time when education was very difficult and they were the first in their respective families, very large families, my father 19 brothers and sisters and my mother had seven, so they, they were the first to get a college education and so they really um, endorsed education as a way out of poverty and, and certainly hammered it in me that I was going to go to college. There was no question about it. So I went to college and went to a, a very good school and ended up getting a PhD at the University of Minnesota. And those of you in psychology know that the University of Minnesota, one of the professors there was Paul Meal, who is legendary, probably the most influential psychologist in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. And in 1954, Paul Meal wrote a book called Clinical Versus Statistical Prediction. And in the field of psychology, it's a um, classic in which he analyzed two broad methods of predicting behavior. One he defined as mechanical, more formal, algorithmic, combining data in a formal way to come to predictive decisions. The second was clinical, which was really seen as more subjective, informal, kind of in the head, the thinking and, and development. And Meal argued in 1954 that mechanical means of prediction are more accurate and more efficient. He further argued that clinicians would make more errors than a mechanical prediction tool created for the same purpose. Now, mechanical prediction methods are simply the combining of data in a specific fashion to come to a prediction. It really can be any kind of data that can be combined. And the key issue is that once you've combined the data, you're likely to come up with the same prediction over and over. There won't be huge variation. As a matter of fact, there really shouldn't be any. The same prediction will be made with the same data. Clinical prediction is dependent entirely on the individual clinician. And it appears that subsequent research supports Meal's initial hypothesis. I mentioned that because that was a driver for me going into Los Angeles County and prior to that when I was director in Hennepin County. But I'll use Los Angeles County as an example. Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services has over 3,000 workers covering 4,000 square miles. Two important points that were 
very clear to me, and I think I would assume it's true in most agencies, perhaps Los Angeles is unique in this, but I don't think so. One is that your agency is only as good as a worse decision maker. If a worker's having a particularly bad day and misses something key in a visit, and the result is a serious child injury or fatality, your agency will be judged by that decision, not by the thousands of other correct decisions that were made that day. It will be that decision, and that, that's repeated over and over. It is the worst decision that the agencies judge by. Second, certain data is critical to every decision. So for example, if I said, a boyfriend with a history of assault on infants has just been released from prison and is, and is moved into the mother's home, and she has three children under the age of three in the home, none of whom are his, my guess is that everybody in the audience would expect that every worker and supervisor would put the same data together, violent boyfriend, vulnerable children, unrelated children, and draw the same conclusion. I would say perhaps you're more confident than I, because I felt like that was still a question. With the same data, would workers put together the data in the same way and come to the same conclusion? If every worker possessed the impeccable clinical skills necessary to walk into a house at 2 in the morning and make the very best decision possible, then I think reliance on clinical judgment is the, the, the logical solution. But as an agency administrator in a place like Los Angeles, I had to essentially guarantee that somebody could walk into a home at 2 in the morning, make the same decision as another worker walking into a house in another community 100 miles away where the circumstances were similar. This is tough work. There is no silver bullet. But predictive analytics, to me, offers a potential breakthrough. This is, for most of us who've administered child welfare agencies, the driver of policy. It's the number of child fatalities that are occurring annually due to child abuse and neglect. As child welfare professionals, we're expected to predict behavior that eliminates child fatalities, that leads to child fatalities. The public expects that there will be zero child fatalities once a child welfare agency has intervened with the family. So for me, the question in a community like Los Angeles was would I endorse a system of clinical, supporting clinical judgment for 3,000 workers or is there a better way to actually put together data to assist in decision making? If we're going to impact this number, I believe the latter is critical, putting together data in some different ways. So let me switch to the second thing that I'm going to talk about, which is the commission. The Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities was created by Congress in 2012 to really address three issues. One, to provide recommendations to the President and Congress to reduce or eliminate child, child abuse or neglect fatalities. Two, was to develop better ways to count child abuse and neglect fatalities nationally. And three, was to develop a national strategy. The concern being that this is an issue that is highlighted particularly in the media as a local or state issue. So this is a, a problem in Texas or it's a problem in Michigan or a problem in Connecticut. But in fact, it's a national issue and we need to really look at how we're connecting the dots nationally. As, as Justice Corrigan mentioned, um, Wade Horn is here in the back. Wade was one of the um, strongest contributors to the commission, I would say. And some of the recommendations, as you, if you, any of you have had a chance to read through the port, report, you'll see Wade's signature on them. The, the commission came to the conclusion that our current system, using our current system, 
which is to is, which is entirely reactionary, waiting for children to be abused or neglected before intervening, cannot achieve the congressional goal of zero fatalities. It, it's simply not possible. There are improvements that can be made that can reduce the number of child abuse and neglect fatalities, but it really takes a rethinking of the system to eliminate child abuse and neglect fatalities. And the, what the commission proposed is rethinking our reactive individual-based approach and look at a public, uh, public health approach to eliminating child abuse and neglect fatalities. And really with, a, with three components that we saw as particularly critical, one is leadership, the second was the better use of data and research, and third was a multidisciplinary response to families. The better use of data and research I'll, I'll primarily focus on because predictive analytics was a major part of that. The other two are, are important components. If there are questions about, can certainly talk about those. So for me as a commissioner, there were several areas that I think lend themselves to predictive analytics that emerged as part of the learning. And I had been a child welfare director for almost 14 years prior to joining the commission, had been at Casey for seven years, and there were some things that I learned that dispelled everything I thought I knew as a child welfare director, which is kind of scary. I'm guessing it's true for many of the child welfare directors across the country. So. One of the, what I'm going to cover are really five highlights for, for me of some of the learnings that, that I had. One was the vulnerability of young children. And going back to the issues of predictive analytics and in the conversations that we had as a commission as well as the research and the hearings that we held, this issue of young children being vulnerable emerged as perhaps the top issue, at least for me. And so everybody in the audience is probably thinking, so what? We all know that. But if you actually look at the time allocated to families, my guess is that most agencies devote most time to older youth who are running from care, who are in congregate care. But it's actually infants who are the most vulnerable. And if you look at policy related to investigations, policy is almost identical for the investigation of an infant as for a 16-year-old. But again, the vulnerability of infants is incredible. So as we get into conversations about policy and the importance of predictive analytics, the, some of this information is absolutely critical as we think about the future of child welfare. Second, and um, this, I'm, this was one of the areas for me. I, I was a um, strong believer in screening out calls at the hotline. We were exposed to research out of California that suggests that the single most important predictor for later child abuse or neglect fatality is a report to child protection hotline for children under age five, regardless of disposition. So regardless of whether they were screened out, regardless of whether the report was substantiated or not. And we are, and nationally, we screen out about 40% of all calls to child protection hotlines. So the question of the vulnerability of young children being screened out is one that we wrestled with as a commission and recommended that screen out policy needs to be revisited. But again, it's a piece of information of data that will be critical going forward in looking at issues of predictive analytics. This issue of health care and public health and the information that we have available in child welfare is important. What we found was that approximately 50% of child abuse and neglect fatalities are known to a child welfare agency prior to the fatality. 
approximately 98% are known to a healthcare agency because physicians have seen the families. So well-coordinated interagency efforts are essential, but information and data is absolutely critical. This issue of, of child protection workers' access to real-time information about families can't be overestimated. The example that we frequently heard about was workers making decisions at 8 in the morning, not knowing that law enforcement had been there at 2 in the morning for a domestic violence call. And so that ability to access real-time information is, is critical to decision making. And finally, the uh, needing to have an accurate count of child abuse and neglect fatalities, not because the number needs to be accurate, and, and as um, Justice Corrigan mentioned earlier, it's somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000, but because we need to better understand what works and what doesn't work and what some of the risk factors are to a better degree than we do. One of the questions that I was asked to at least touch on is the role of the federal government. This is one of the roles that the federal government should be playing a much stronger role in. I'm going to go through the last few slides um, very quickly. This one, though, is the quote that, one of the quotes from our report that reflects for uh, the commission the importance of, of predictive analytics. The primary recommendation that the commission made is actually a review process that is designed after the work that occurred in Florida with Eckerd and includes many of the components. It's, um, it, it, we're hoping that additional information is made available to states, but the work that you heard described earlier between Mindshare, Eckerd, and in um, Tampa, Florida is work that the commission was particularly impressed with. The, um, we had the opportunity as a commission to actually visit um, MITRE, which does much of the um, safety work for the airline industry. And while the airline industry is certainly different than child protection, I would argue it gives a picture of what's possible in child welfare and child protection. The use of data to actually predict issues prior to a crash is similar to the use of data in child protection to intervene successfully and less intrusively with families prior to fatality. And I'll just give one example in closing. And that is that the, again, research out of California suggests that a teen who ha is involved in the child protection system who has a child will has the, has a 45% chance of having a case open as an as a parent by the time that child turns age 5 and so on current child protection caseloads there are pregnant or parenting teens whose likelihood of being in child protection as an adult is 45% and my guess is there is very little being done to intervene aggressively in a positive way, not removing the children, but in a positive way that will, will make a difference in that number. And that's the kind of thing to me, very practical, that we should be doing that would make a, a difference in later child abuse and neglect and fatalities. I will close on that. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for your remarks. I would now like to introduce uh, Commissioner John Specia, also Judge John Specia, Commissioner, Commissioner of the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, which I believe is the second largest system in the country after California. Uh, Judge Specia has been leading Texas for four years. Uh, and uh, at the end of May, he will be retiring. He tells me to spend time with his six grandchildren under six years old, so uh, well-deserved. Uh, retirement. In his background um, in 18 years on the bench, 
Uh, he formed a children's court, a family drug treatment court. He chaired the Texas Supreme Court Commission on Foster Care. He's been an administrative judge, um, a master, and a regional attorney for human services. Uh, so uh, we are very interested. Texas has gone its own way with predictive analytics, uh, as Texas's want to do. And we uh, welcome Judge Specia to talk about Texas's experience with predictive analytics. John, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mara. Uh, very happy to be here today. And just as an overview, we're trying to use uh, predictive analytics to more effectively use our data. This morning when they said we have a lot of data and very little information, that really struck home. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize my uh, director of data analysis, Dr. Jane Burstein, who is here today. And we've gone our own way, but we have stood on the shoulders of Casey and Eckhart. And, and we are, we've used lots of stuff, and we are very appreciative of that. Just to give you an idea of the size, uh, we have over 7 million children in Texas. Uh, Harris County is one of the four counties with the largest child population, 1.1 million children. Uh, Texas is a state-administered program, so we have 254 counties. And out in West Texas, some of those counties have more jackrabbits than people. And so we have a very, very geographically, culturally diverse state. Uh, we receive over 250,000 child abuse and neglect reports per year. Uh, we provide in-home services for more than 85,000 children. Uh, and we have more than 45 children in the system over the year, about 30,000 at any given time. We are using predictive analytics. One tool we have set up is a geographic hotspot report. Uh, data that is across the state of Texas is extraordinarily misleading. And we are more and more bringing our data down to the community level, the county level, uh, to take a look at that. And we've generated a report by county uh, that statistically analyzes multiple factors to identify counties that are at risk of a higher rate of investigations uh, past 60 days time frame. And so we're trying to get out ahead of counties uh, before they're in real trouble by identifying them. Uh, we have put together uh, a concept of master investigators that we send to counties that are in trouble. Uh, very, very senior investigators and supervisors that go in, uh, help train workers, help close cases, and then literally they travel three weeks a month and they go back to their home community one week and then go back out on the road. Uh, we use uh, this information, the hotspot report, to help our regional directors. We have 11 different regions in the state of Texas uh, manage their resources. Uh, from May 2014 to May 2015, uh, using this tool and, and other kinds of management directions, uh, uh, we've reduced uh, uh, the number of cases closing within 60 days by 10%. Uh, and we've increased timely investigation closures in every region. Uh, some by as much as 17%. This is a concept we borrowed from Eckert. Uh, we were very impressed at the Safety Forum about uh, looking at specific cases, and so we have instituted a real-time in-home services case read based on statistically analyzing multiple factors to identify cases at a higher risk for serious abuse or neglect during an open in-home study. Uh, we use a structured case reading tool. It's done within the first 30 days. Uh, uh, and if there's an issue, uh, we do immediate follow-up, much in the same vein as the coaching model that they were talking about with Eckert. Uh, based on the pilot that we've run, we had about an estimate of 30% reduction in serious abuse and neglect during an open family-based safety service case. And now we're rolling this out statewide. I've got about 300 contracts with child placement agencies that provide foster care all the way through residential treatment. Uh, and our monitoring on those historically has really been financial monitoring. Uh, so we, we are changing that and we are looking at a performance-based model. So we analyzed uh, multiple factors to identify children at higher risk for a report of abuse or neglect in foster care. Uh, 
the contract monitors will use a structured case review tool to review the files from the private child placing agencies. Uh, our goal here is to identify agencies that are trending towards putting risks at children and intervening earlier rather than waiting for an incident and then going in and suspending the contract or, 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 or the license. Uh, and so we are, we're starting a pilot in this area. Uh, we started in January 2016. <clears throat> we're trying to use predictive analytics. Uh, we're, we are making many, many, many changes in Texas. Uh, we are trying to transform our system. Uh, to be a continuous learning organization. Uh, we are starting new initiatives all over the state. And so we're using uh, a predictive analytical tool to evaluate whether the outcomes for children and families receiving new interventions are statistically more likely to achieve improved outcomes. Historically, uh, we take a long time to plan something, then we enact it across the state, and then we don't measure whether or not this has actually made a difference trying to change that model completely. We're trying to roll things out on a safe to fail basis, start small, learn, and then continually evaluate and make course corrections to make sure we're getting the outcomes that we set at the beginning of the project. Lessons learned, and you really have heard these. Uh, we see this as most useful uh, in targeting our limited resources and evaluating new programs. Uh, we recognize the limitations that we are not going to identify individual cases um, for abuse or neglect. It is a, a way to pick a group of cases to provide more attention to uh, and drive and work on. Uh, real challenge with the legislature. When they heard the word predictive analytics, they were all over it. It was going to be the answer and it was the silver bullet. And so I've really had to work on. Uh, good news is I got 11 new data analysts saying we were gonna use predictive analytics. Bad news is they're expecting the system to be different tomorrow. So we're really working on, on uh, talking about uh, the limitations of predictive analytics, that it's going to help us to identify high-risk cases, provide more resources of those high-risk cases, uh, but there's not a tool that's going to say this family uh, is, is in trouble and we should take the kids. And, and we, need to, we need to guard against the unintended consequences and, and make sure that, that we're getting the outcomes that we want. I, I love this morning when they were talking about the reunification pilot of doing those analysis after reunification rather than before and, and perhaps not working with families. Uh, as as my, my uh, head of analytics says, uh, they're gonna be really, really high-risk families uh, and they will never experience negative outcomes. There are going to be some very low-risk families that we have fatalities in. And so this is not a perfect tool to analyze families at that. And, and I think this morning when they were talking about the rarity of the events, fatalities, and the long causal links, that's, that's really important. Uh, I've had oil was good for my four years doing this job. And so I went through two legislation sessions where they had money, which is a very good thing. And uh, I was able to uh, obtain specialized staff that are working uh, on these issues, on, on uh, business process and data. Uh, these staff are getting specialized trainings and have the, the, the educational background to do this kind of work. I think what is critically important and what we've done I've got these 11 analysts, uh, analysts and, and we are dispersing them out to the regions to really look at the problems of the individual regions. Uh, we're trying to make them be regional people and not state people. As Dr. Burstein told me this morning at breakfast, if you're a state person, you lose all credibility out there in those regions. But her staff are viewed as local people. Uh, and we really are hired them for their ability to communicate. Uh, the best data person, if they can't explain it, can't help the field do something. And so the complicated algorithms and, and all that stuff we're doing, that's good stuff, but we've got to have people out there that understand it, can define the problem, 
uh, look at the data and then help the, the regional staff and, and the, the leadership staff to utilize this data in an appropriate way. And it must be part of a larger effort to create a data-informed culture and a continuous quality improvement project. That's been uh, where, where we're headed. We're a continuous learning organization. Uh, data is a conversation starter. Uh, what we do after that and what we do with the data and how we help the families is, is most important. And we've still got to do some basic data analysis, not, not call everything predictive analytics when it's not. Uh, and we need to support staff in, in effectively using these tools and not this information needs to be supportive and helpful to the workers and not used punitively or as a substitute for clinical judgment. It's got to be used in conjunction with the clinical judgment. All right. Thank you, Judge Specia and Commissioner Specia. And thanks to our panel for uh, their insights this morning on, as, as leaders in child welfare systems. Um, I would like to give each one of you, if you choose, an opportunity to comment or ask questions of other panelists before we open the floor uh, to questions. Are there any comments that any of you want to make on one another's presentations? Actually, I have a question for Go Mrs. For it. Katz um, and for Susan. Both of you <clears throat> mentioned several times the um, issue of, of clinical capacity and, and essentially the tools that can be used to enhance clinical capacity. Can you say a little about your perceptions of the kind of variability across the state of social workers and their clinical capacity and the likelihood of reaching a point where you're pretty comfortable with the individual kind of gut decision which would be informed by information? I, I think that, you know, I wish I had a, a, a clear answer on, on some of that. There's a lot of work that, that we've been doing in a variety of ways. Um, I didn't really speak to some of this on, on, on the slide, but we've been doing a lot of staff competency building to, to support some of that. There's actually a, a, a lot of work that we're doing complementary to this related um, to workforce um, development and, and even changing some of the credentialing of, of our staff. Um, we're, we're looking to actually have staff who are coming in uh, master's prepared as opposed to the bachelor prepared so I don't have like a, a, a strong answer in terms of you know this is this is going to be kind of that bright line moment but we've been making some some steady changes and some steady progress so that we can hopefully have a more even platform for, for our staff but but again with some of this is that we're hoping that staff at all different levels are going to be there to support them kind of horizontally and vertically so that um, the competencies of our, of our managerial level staff, um, our supervisors, as well as the folks who are supporting them in, in other arenas are also will support that that some of the, that folks aren't kind of necessarily out doing this all by themselves and all alone. So even if we have folks who perhaps uh, don't have the, the, the level of skill and, and, and clinical insight that we would want for all staff, that there are some other folks that are, that are there to help um, them uh, uh, hopefully achieve uh, similar uh, positive outcomes for, for the, their, their families. Two, two. two things I'd like to add to that. So uh, historically, we outsourced a lot of work around um, uh, substance abuse and domestic violence, and we've actually turned that in-house so that there are uh, experts in both of those areas in every office, not just in every region. And to Susan's point, they're involved very early on in the process. So very briefly, um, we have a, 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 a new, um, I hate to call these things um, protocols, but, but essentially that's really what it is. About two years ago, we started what we call um, considered removal team meetings. And what that means in every instance where a case comes to our attention where there are serious safety issues around uh, children and there's a very significant risk of removal, what I used to say to the lawyers is it's a, it's a rebuttable presumption. The presumption is we're removing the child. What can you do to rebut it? And uh, so we bring everybody to the table. We invite the parents, obviously, uh, extended family, lawyers, doctors, uh, clergy, anybody that they want to bring to the table. And there's a conversation about 
what can that family do to ensure the child's safety? Or does a, is a removal nevertheless necessary? And on our side, we bring all of our clinical staff to that very first meeting. Because that's where I really think the die is cast. It's, it's sort of when you go to a physician. It's that first interaction where all of your symptoms are discussed that really sets the pattern for, uh, for where that case goes. And so on our end, we bring those experts to the table, our ACR staff, um, if necessary, we bring um, our DV consultants, our, our opioid specialists, and everybody comes to the table to have that first meeting. And I will tell you, because again, I think that's really where the trajectory starts, uh, and we've done thousands of cases to date, 50% uh, of the time, children are not removed. And the 50% of the time where children do have to be removed, they are placed with families, family members and relatives, uh, or, or what we call fictive kin. And, um, and for, I'm sure everyone in the room, uh, I'm always late to the game and late to the table in terms of, of definitions, particularly at DCF where everything has an acronym. But, but um, my, or my easy definition of fictive kin is that when I think about when I grew up, I had 20 aunts and uncles and none of them were biologically related. <laughs> but they were all people uh, to whom I could turn and people um, to whom my parents could turn. And uh, so 50% of the cases, the children uh, where they do have to be removed, in 50% of those cases, they are going to relatives. And we know that that reduces the significant trauma that those children experience upon the removal. So, so again, long answer to a short question. But I think those, if, if it's not going to be the frontline social worker, and admittedly often it is not, because that social worker, even if they have a, a, a BSW or an MSW, they're 23, 24, 25 years of age. And so and I, I hope my remarks earlier on talking about critical thinking, I mean, that's really essential. But again, at that age, um, it, it's, uh, it's sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. So by having those clinical staff members there early on, we're really able, I think, to influence the process. John? Yeah. I, it's interesting to me because we uh, started using a structured decision-making tool about three, or started when I first got there and we finally got it in, but there was real pushback from the clinical staff on the structured decision-making tool. It's going to take away clinical judgment. Well, they're tools, and, and they're not numbers. I don't want to use numbers, but the tools are important, particularly with the 22, 23-year-olds, even if they've got an MSW. And so the communication piece of communicating the usefulness of the tools and the benefit of the tools to families is where we've got to focus. There's a lot of tools. The safety science stuff in the airlines industry, I think we could learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. uh, using predictive analytics to talk about turnover and, and doing something about that. Uh, any, anything, anything we can do on that, let's do that. But, but that it's the marriage of the tools and, and getting the clinicians and the data folks working together for better outcomes for children. We have about 12 states that have registered for this, and I presume that that's because of their interest, perhaps, in pursuing predictive analytics. Uh, and I, I would, on their behalf, like to ask a couple of questions around budget um, and uh, what, I mean, large state budget, Texas, um, versus middle-sized uh, state of Connecticut, what do you look at in terms of asking your legislature for budget at the state level? Number two, how do you see the role of the federal government in uh, encouraging the utilization of predictive analytics uh, nationally? I want a 90% match to upgrade my <laughs> SACWA system, number one. Uh, uh, I, I, the standard definition of what is a child fatality, I think that's real important. But really, we've got these SACWA systems here that were supported by the federal government early on, and we're not getting the money in now, and we need some help on that. Some of the limitations in our big state is we're in the process of completely redoing our system. It's slow and long, and we have lots and lots of data. But every time I ask for something, they say it costs a million dollars to get it. And I really don't like that. So when it's finished, it will be much more agile. We will have business intelligent tools. And that will make it easier to use tools to assist workers, even at the, the worker and supervisor level. Um, when I 
when I came in, I had a budget of $895 million, and five years later, my budget is nine is $794 million. So I've lost over a million dollars uh, in budgeting. And, and for those of you familiar with Connecticut politics lately, we have not recovered from the recession. So it really has been a challenge. Um, I talk, when I first came in, I said, we don't need more money. We just need to do things um, smarter. And I think we've been able to do that. Um, Having said that, I think we're right now at the bone. So to me, it's a question of really also incentivizing. And, and what can the federal government do to help incentivize the right behaviors? Uh, so certainly, uh, we're also in the process of redesigning our SACWA system, which is incredibly costly and very time consuming. And so if, we, uh, if we're able to recover 50%, I'll take it. Um, but you know, historically, the, the federal government, I think, has not done the best job of incentivizing behaviors, so foster care. Uh, as an example, as opposed to how can we reimburse keeping children for programs that keep children in the home? Uh, when we think about um, certain interventions, if if uh, visits take place in offices, they're not going to be reimbursed. Is you have to actually hospitalize a child? Was well, that really what we want to encourage? Is that is that the kind of behaviors that we want to uh, engage in? So I think all of this uh, is just a way of saying to the federal government, those of you in the room. Thank you. Um, to, and I know we're making huge strides. I, I don't want to minimize them, but um, more is better. Uh, at this point, uh, Anne Marie. Um, Anne Marie Ambrose with KT Family Programs. We've heard lots of folks being interested in um, predictive analytics, but one of the big concerns is something that you talked about, Susan, which is the disparate impact. And you talked a lot about values and guiding principles and mission, which I love, and sort of laying the foundation around those really important things before you launched this. How are you going to ensure accountability that those things aren't compromised by your use of predictive analytics? So what are you building into the process to ensure that you can still stay true to the values and guiding principles? Sure. Uh, thank you for the for the question. Um, I think there are a myriad of ways that, that we're looking at this. I think it's, again, really on, ongoingly engaging that data. So creating that expectation that we're doing that pathway data is one way that we are having to engage that data. Are we seeing certain things that don't look right to us? Um, we also have myriad other data and, uh, and data sets and, and dashboards that we break down and require folks to, to look and explicate their data in a disaggregated way, looking at uh, the impact on, on, on race and, and ethnicity. So for example, we're, we're one of the, we're a state that uh, has very much embra embraced RBA uh, results-based accountability and they have the kind of the core questions and how much, how well, and um, you know, anyone better off. We've kind of added the fourth is who's better off? And that is just kind of standardly a part of what we ask of, of all of our look into to our data on the contract side as, as well as the implementation of, of our services uh, uh, within the department. We also have a statewide racial justice work group. Um, and that includes representatives throughout various levels of the department as well as external partners. And we um, have that facilitated um, with some university partners as, as well. And those folks are, are intending to keep us honest. And in fact, when we had um, our, our, our recent meeting was about a week or two ago, Commissioner. Um, that was a question. Folks asked us about this and, and pointedly wanted to know, what are we going to do and, and how are we going to ensure that this uh, doesn't perhaps um, get used or, or, or become um, uh, you know, something that negatively impacts our, our, our families? And, and we talked about a lot of the, the background work that we've done, a lot of the homework that we've been doing, and our interest in having them keep us honest. So it's kind of the engagement of the data, but also having other folks who are interested and who are also going to be looking at it so that we have some other folks who can kind of say, wait a minute, we're not li we don't like what we see here and what are you going to do about it? Uh, just following up briefly, so about 80% of our contracts uh, and our providers have to enter this data in their systems as well. And, and hopefully in the, in the foreseeable future we'll be at 100%. And so it is one of the things that we ask them to, to look at. And uh, it's also particularly important with our differential response system because this year we, we ran into some difficulty uh, to, to um, Mr. Sanders, Dr. Sanders' point about fatality. So if you have a fatality on the differential response, in a case on a differential response track, the immediate reaction of, of um, legislators are to, to obviously pull funding for differential response. 
independent of whether or not it should have been on that track to begin with. Uh, so we had some, some serious pushback this year, and, and uh, one of the ways actually we were able to successfully combat uh, legislator reaction, uh, legislative reaction was to show the, the phenomenal data that Susan's kept track of, and she can share it with you in particular, around uh, populations of color and how successful we've been with differential response in that regard, and it, and it, it puts people back on their feet, or, or off their feet, I should say. Thank you. Oh, so I think with the commissioner, the, the piece that you wanted to talk about with our differential response is that actually we have seen for our African American families that they are 19% less likely than Caucasian families to have a subsequent report. So we wanted to make sure that folks were thinking about that as well. That you know we don't often see um, those type of, of, of results with with our families of color. And so it was clearly a very promising and, and, and bright line piece. And, and for our, for our far, we actually partner with a, a unit university to, to uh, do the evaluation. So we were very interested in wanting to make sure that, that folks were, were thinking about the, the positive potential impact of a differential response system in Connecticut, specifically for our families of color, rather than being re so reactionary to, to a single death, but we wanted them to be tempered and looking measuredly at some of the other results uh, as, as well. So. All right. Other questions? Really? <laughs> Any any comments, questions from the audience? Yes, John. So, yeah, it, as I'm hearing this, it's a, it's another important. There's a microphone there. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Uh, as I'm hearing this, it's looking like it's another important tool. Kind of some mentioning differential response, family preservation. So. The danger, I think, has always been in the past is those practices get taken and then maybe whether you want to call it watered down or tweaked in a way that is not, you know, the best practice. So I guess how do you assure as we use these tools that they get done right so that, you know, you don't get the model, the example in some location where it, it is not effectively implemented and the whole system gets trashed or the whole practice gets trashed, I guess. Earlier on, they talked about the expertise and the risk. I think we need to be careful. Not anybody can do this. You have to have staff at a very high level with the background and the experience, or you need to hire consultants that can do this properly. And, and so I think, you know, and, and not call everything predictive analytics. I mean, it is a tool that does certain things. It doesn't do away with basic data analysis. And so I think we need to talk about the limitations of it, but it is a tool and then work within the limitations, but also grow it using safety science and, and that kind of stuff. Okay. Brian. Yeah, I'll just comment on that particular question because with any state that we are working with, we require that they participate in quarterly fidelity reviews if they're gonna continue to work with us. So we're gonna go in, look at how they're pulling the prediction, the cases that they're reviewing. Are they reviewing the cases according to the model? Uh, what are their integrated reliability issues look like? So um, all of that's part of the, uh, the process if you're working um, with us, and, and it's uh, something we're doing in all five of those states. That's great. Any other questions or, oh, yes. <clears throat> and uh, this comes from a uh, lack of knowledge perhaps, but so excuse me. But in federal state relations and funding streams and systems requirements, there are sometimes mandates and federal requirements that state systems have certain functionality. And I'm wondering for Dr. Sanders, was there a consideration or how would you feel about a strong federal requirement that if we're giving you money to assist in systems building, there needs to be a predictive analytics function attached to the state system? So um, I think the, I'm not sure, and, and Dr. Horn may have some thoughts on this too, I don't think that the commission was kind of strong enough on the um, predictive analytics, for example, for that to be connected directly to funding in the way you described. There were other pieces that were, and I actually think, and, and I think that, I was gonna say I think, but the, both the commission did, the commission did as well, that the federal role does need to be much stronger in several different areas and that as much as that was difficult for some of us who 
always argued for a much stronger state or local role. There, there really does need to be more direction, particularly with those areas that seem to work, A and B, to encourage states to try different ideas rather than be limited to what's traditionally been offered. And so, and, and, and so while we didn't speak directly to what the question around predictive analytics, there were other areas that we felt were important and that the federal government role needs to be stronger in defining those. The, the definition of child abuse and neglect fatality, for example, okay. I mean, the fact that we can't look across the country and say how many fatalities there are, that really is a federal responsibility. And so, so there were areas like that that we felt this much stronger federal role. Yes, Judge Payne. Jim Payne from Indiana. I hadn't thought about it until the question earlier and judge your response. Is there any initiative or is there any um, uh, possibility that the, the, the expertise, the specialization that you referred to about predictive analytics is being uh, studied in mathematics or some other occupation so that in, <clears throat> in the need to hire a specialist who can uh, help monitor, even implement predictive analytics, that there's a subspecialty of analytics. I don't know what that would be. Uh, th and would that be helpful to the local states as hopefully 50 states and uh, other local jurisdictions begin to implement this? Uh, if you don't have the resources, as you suggested, this is going to be very challenging and maybe misused. So I don't know if someone in the audience or someone on, on uh, watching can at least consider that because it strikes me, John, that without that, this is going to be very challenging to successfully implement. I agree. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one last question, I think, or comment. Yes. Hi, Woody Kessel. Uh, I'm a pediatrician from uh, on the faculty at Dartmouth. Uh, just as we close this out, uh, I would welcome your thoughts about connecting what we've been talking about today, which is really focused downstream on the fatalities of serious untoward events. How can we connect what you've learned and what you've practiced in your field experience and, and frankly, even applying the predictive analytics further upstream um, into different opportunities into prevention rather than, rather than where we are, um, yeah, frankly, in this tragedy. But just your closing thoughts maybe on moving this further upstream with your experiences in the field and even the use of the predictive analytics themselves and moving things uh, further upstream to a, a, a more effective intervention likelihood. Comments, panelists? We spend a very, very small percentage of my budget on prevention. We have doubled that in the last few years. But I think we can use predictive analytics to identify the highest risk, and we're actually doing that in a new program that focuses on children under five. And, and we need to be spending more money on prevention to keep you know the front door. Once they get in the front door, it's it's... It's a whole different ball game. We got to keep people out of the front door. I would. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that my perception is that until there's a sense that agencies are able to impact fatalities, or that fatalities are not the sole responsibility of child protection agencies, it will be difficult to have a conversation other than what do we do when there's a child fatality. It, it seems like, at, at least my experience, certainly in the two jurisdictions, but in Los Angeles, was that everything else was nice, but that was, that was your business. And so, yes, you could, you know, it's nice that you're trying this prevention effort in this community, but why did this child die? And I, and I just think, as a field, we've not been able to, to, to get control of that. We, we've, 
I think of late in particular, we've done a lot in Connecticut and working with the medical profession. Um, we adopted, now some of this is again after the horse is out of the barn, uh, medical guidelines because we found out in our 26 hospitals, a lot of them didn't have pediatric emergency departments. And a lot of pediatricians, as you know, um, who are trained in child abuse don't always, next, and fortunately don't get to necessarily practice it, but certainly uh, ED docs often don't remember um, what they learned 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, so what we did is we adopted medical guidelines, which the entire, um, which the Connecticut uh, Association of Pediatricians adopted and embraced, requiring certain protocols to be followed any time a child presents in the emergency department, a child under the age of six. And we did six again because it's always those are the children who are most vulnerable and the fewest eyes are on them. So that, that's one thing that we did. Um, we have an early practice guide that we developed again with the help of uh, our pediatrician as well as other uh, pediatricians in the state to, to talk about what can and should be done with um, that, that particularly vulnerable population. Uh, we adopted safe sleep uh, campaign and rolled it out in hospitals and in fact legislation now supporting it so that anytime every child that's born in a hospital, um, and where obviously most are, uh, parents are instructed about what safe sleep should look like, back to sleep, they're given all the materials, et cetera. And then in any instance uh, where we have a, a vulnerable parent or a teen parent, the department comes in again by way of prevention and supplies the family with cribs and all the literature around, and pack and plays, whatever is necessary, and all the literature around safe sleep. We engage visiting nurses uh, to come in and work with those families again. I mean, we don't move in, and you know, there's always that, that fine line. Uh, we don't move in, but, but we've, we've done an enormous amount of work in that regard. And then finally, on the prevention side, I think where we're, we're trying to uh, make some serious strides is around mental health, because there are very few child psychiatrists as you know. And so uh, we're working with pediatricians to be able to uh, develop, again, some protocols and early warning signs so that because every, every child, and, and to Dr. Sanders' point, about 98% of them are, are seen in the medical profession, whereas only 50% are seen in child welfare, uh, that, that our pediatricians throughout the state uh, can work with our families around early signs of of um, me around mental health issues and early trauma, et cetera. So again, we can do that, we can get in early. Uh, we have run over time, uh, and I hope that the audience will um, <coughs> join me in thanking our wonderful panel. I hope that we have uh, fulfilled your goals for <laughs> participating as an audience in learning more about predictive analytics, and we shall see where this goes in our country. Thank you all for joining us today.